The ADP hiring report was definitely clear. The big question is whether it was right. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Boston. And I'm Scarlett Fu. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S. Right now, let's take a look at how markets are trading. Not a lot of big moves in equities or treasuries. You can see the S&P 500 pretty much flat right now. Of course, there's a lot of talk about the benchmark index making a double top after climbing to almost 4,600 last week, which some technicians say could suggest there's some downside ahead. The 10-year yield uh, coming down a little bit, uh, five basis points of 4.11 percent. Yesterday, it dipped below 4.2 percent for the first time in three months. I'm looking at oil, though, down three and a half percent, pretty sizable move there. That's a five month low below $70 a barrel as well. This is a fifth straight day of losses for oil. A lot of concern. There's too much supply out there, even after OPEC Plus moved ahead with some production cuts. And Bitcoin continues to bounce around here. It did vault past $44,000, but right now just below that level. It's not clear what's driving a lot of the recent movement in Bitcoin, whether it's a Fed easing or excitement over a possible Bitcoin ETF for Maine. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that today. But I do want to go back to crude oil and really put the move that we've been seeing lately into better context here. We talk about that drop. You go all the way back to mid-June and that 40% rally that followed through late September, 36 of the 40 percentage points of gains that we saw in WTI crude, gone. Energy stocks, now the second worst performers among the S&P sectors year to date. And this breathtaking drop in crude prices from more than 90 bucks a barrel down to about 69 today is now slipping outside the grasp of OPEC, as Scarlett was just talking about, to halt any slide. Bulging inventories, anemic industrial activity, and moves in interest rates, and the dollar, all working against Saudi Arabia and the rest of that cartel. We're going to have more on that story a little bit later in the show. We're also going to talk about the other big story down in Washington. That was the Senate hearing featuring the CEOs of the biggest U.S. banks. That includes J.P. Morgan, Goldman, City, Wells Fargo, BNY Mellon, Morgan Stanley, and State Street. Now, most of the conversation was just a pantomime of lawmakers threatening any more regulation and the bank executives smirking and saying, hold your horses. But one weird area of common ground was crypto. Everyone seems to hate it. And Jamie Dimon even went so far to agree with Elizabeth Warren and saying he'd close it all down if he were in charge of the government. But he's not. Anyway, let's go back to, well, the monthly ritual of parsing ADP private payroll hiring data to divine what the official monthly government report will show days later. Scarlett, this is always a futile exercise, but we're going to do it anyway, because I think it's interesting. The numbers may not match up, but I think the trend might match up, and that is towards a softer labor market. That's a really important point. Let's take a look at what the numbers show, because the big eco data point of the day was definitely the November ADP jobs report. And what it showed is that private payrolls increased by 103,000 last month. Uh, that is the white, those are the white bars. That is weaker than expected. So it does reinforce this idea of a cooling labor market. And of course, this is now helping set expectations for a soft government jobs report on Friday, even though historically, there isn't really much of a correlation here. That nevertheless feeds into predictions on when the Fed will eventually make its pivot. In the meantime, volatility in equities fairly suppressed. The last time that the VIX traded above 20 was during the late October sell-off. The VIX, of course, in white here. Since then, it's been a steady line lower through November as the S&P 500 rallied almost 9%. By contrast, look at the blue line there. That's the move index, which measures volatility in treasuries. And while that did also come down in November, you could see that the gyrations have really picked up this month as investors position for eventual rate cuts. Romain? All right, Scarlett. Well, let's go back uh, to that VIX because I think the VIX has put us all to sleep over the last uh, few days, weeks, and months. And to a certain extent, the rally in stocks did as well. Jake Jolly joining us right now to help kick things off to the close. Head of investment analysis over at BNY Mellon Investment Management. And Jake, I'm kind of facetious about it kind of uh, being a bit of a snoozer. But yeah, I mean, we always kind of talk about this idea of whether there is real buy-in to some of these bull runs and whether this is a bull run or not. That'll remain to be seen. But when you look at some of the other metrics surrounding the equity market. What is that telling you about the commitment to uh, the rally? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start with the positives, mm -hmm. right? Um, we did see a broadening out, I think, you know, through this uh, November rally, uh, I'll call it. It was very strong, of course. Um, you know, it seems to be very strongly linked to moves in, you know, expectations around Fed funds rate. You know, when we look at how many cuts were priced in to that December 2024 uh, uh, Fed futures pricing, mm -hmm. it moved quite aggressively, and we saw that, you know, uh, 
results in sort of that upward repricing in, uh, in the S&P 500 multiples. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the big story this year has just been how concentrated performance has been in the S&P 500, mm -hmm. right? And what we saw in November was that you know some of those other 490 names actually started to do a bit better, right? So I think you know that is to me is the positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, the less positive factor, of course, is that okay, we saw that re-rating uh, in multiples really tied very closely to the Fed funds cuts being priced in. Right. You know how realistic is that? And I was looking today. I think you know the first cut is now priced in for March of next yeah. year, just 53% um, probability. So it's you know borderline, but that seems very early to me. Yeah. Um, you know my view would be that if you're starting to see cuts that early, they're probably more likely to be those growth-saving recessionary emergency cuts, right? And that's yeah. not going to be a good thing for risk assets. Are you seeing any of those recessionary or red flags, cautionary flags, if you will, in the economic data yet? Oh, I think they're definitely still there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think we all kind of get into this recession fatigue, right? We've had the conference board's leading economic indicators in negative territory for 18, 19 months or whatever mm -hmm. now. Um, but that doesn't mean we should be dismissing them, right? I mean, yes, the economy has changed, um, but I think you still have to, you know, be uh, eyes wide open about these things, yeah. um, which is why, you know, when we look to next year, we are more positive on equities than we were, you know, at the beginning of this year. Um, but I think, you know, compared to sort of a typical year where we say, and, when you, and just to be clear, when yeah. you say more positive, you're talking about on a going forward basis. On right? a going forward yeah, okay. basis, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we probably overestimated recession probabilities coming into this year. Yeah. Now we're more balanced, but we still have a recession probability for 2024. That's about two times what it would be in a typical year, mm -hmm. right? So it's hard for us to get really excited about risk assets. Now, the good news about that is that there are a lot of other opportunities out there. So we think that you can add a lot of value through diversifying both regionally and across asset classes into next year. I want to focus on equities for a moment here because you talk about recession fatigue and whether we're going to have a recession. How is that showing up in earnings and how management uh, navigates yeah. you know, their forecasts and, and uh, just their operations? Well, you always have to take you know, management commentary with a grain of salt, sure. right? They're, they're trying to manage expectations for the future. Um, but I think one thing that did come through, and I saw this in a, in a Bloomberg article a couple weeks ago, was that you know one of the trending terms was weak demand, mm -hmm. right? It was it picking wasn't, up. It wasn't Riz. What's that? It wasn't, it wasn't Riz. Riz. No, they were not talking about their Riz as, uh, as CEOs of these companies. Um, but I think you know when we look to next year, and especially on earnings, um, you know. Basically, what's being priced in is that the worst is behind us, that we've had this inflection. We're going to have earnings growing, you know, strong, potentially 10 percent into next year. Um, you have to, you know, put that uh, or juxtaposition uh, next to what is the economic background look like, right? Mm -hmm. And if you believe that there's this step down in growth, that consumers are going to be facing ongoing headwinds, it's hard to sort of get too enthusiastic yeah. about that 10% because I, I think you, you need to be very uh, critical of it. Okay, you said it would be a good opportunity to look elsewhere to diversify your portfolio. Outside of equities, you do like high quality bonds. So we're talking investment grade specifically. Which sectors or which geographies look most appealing? Yeah, so I mean, definitely favoring right now sovereigns and high quality. Uh, so, uh, you know, investment grade uh, over high yield still uh, makes a lot of sense to us, given where spreads are right now, how tight things still are. Mm -hmm. um, and given our expectations, you know, like I said, we still have that elevated recession probability, although um, actually for the first time in, in a number of months, we actually are now expecting that recession is odds against, right? So we've moved it below 50%. So that's really why you're seeing sort of us being a bit more balanced um, in our asset allocation recommendations. But you know, one of the things that hasn't changed is that we've been preaching extending duration for a long time. Um, and that was obviously very painful uh, during sort of the latter part of the summer into the fall. Um, but that has obviously been paying off quite a bit uh, of late. And we would expect it to continue to be uh, a very favorable uh, risk return uh, trade off into next year. Where is when you put that next to sort of equities, you know, they're already trading pretty expensive. It feels like the risk is still, you know, more skewed to the downside than it is for bonds. Um, so that's why we're, we're definitely still in the camp of saying, you know, consider that fixed income allocation before you just dive back in and start buying uh, risk assets. All right, Jake, always great to catch up with you. Jake Jolly, head of investment analysis over at BNY Mellon Investment Management, helping to kick things off to the close here on this Wednesday afternoon. Coming up. We're going to go down to Washington where big bank CEOs testifying before the Senate why they say a proposal to raise capital requirements would hurt their industry.
Plus, we'll talk with the CEO of a startup specializing in high-performance batteries. Nanograph tells us their take on competing with China, which currently controls much of the world's battery production. And uh, the Journal of Financial Economics did something the other day they haven't done ever, and that was retract a paper, one of the most seminal papers on bond pricing and the predictive nature of the market. We're actually going to talk to the 28-year-old doctoral student who actually had that paper retracted. That conversation and so much more coming up in just a bit. This is Bloomberg. Shares of Citigroup rising 4% today after the CFO Mark Mason said full-year revenue guidance does remain on track. That is in spite of a potential 20% slump in trading revenue in the fourth quarter. So joining us now from Washington is Bloomberg's Shanali Basak. And Shanali, I guess it's pretty telling that the stock is up when the firm is just reiterating its guidance as opposed to raising it. Well, listen, we know that volatility is, well, volatile. We know that the big businesses that Citigroup has been trading in, fixed income, currencies, commodities, rates around the world, some of that volatility has started to subside, as you would expect, as people expect us to get towards the end of a rate hiking cycle in the United States. Now, listen, though, even with the potential 20% drop in trading, that sets a bar. Now we have to hear from the rest of the banks as well on how much they might feel that trading slump. The interesting thing about Citigroup, with a revenue target is with it came a stability in its expense guidance. And the reason that's so important for Citigroup, Scarlett, is because the severance costs could have been mounting into more than a billion dollars, even more than that. They said it'll be around that range. And given that that is keeping expenses stable, gives Citigroup some stable footing to sit on, stand on, while they move forward here and pursue yeah. these cost-cutting exercises and cutting jobs around the world. All right, Shanali. Well, you're down in Washington, as our viewers can see, and my guess is uh, a lot of the lawmakers on Capitol Hill today didn't actually ask Jane Frazier or any of the other executives about the bottom lines at their businesses here. Uh, this was uh, that annual, I guess they go get their talking to from Congress. What exactly uh, was the exchange like today? There's a few interesting things. On one hand, you had Sherrod Brown right before the meeting speak to me, senator from Ohio, about how the banks don't have a leg to stand on here when it comes to fighting those capital rules. But they did get a welcome ear from other senators and even a welcome exchange with Senator Elizabeth Warren, who seems to have shifted her focus by and large to the crypto industry and the anti-money laundering rules there. A particularly interesting uh, piece of sound here from another senator from Ohio, Republican J.D. Vance. Take a listen here really quickly. As a person, like you said, who's invested uh, in, in a private fund, they have their place in the economy. But you don't want to artificially drive funds to private uh, to private equity. One, because the liquidity is much less accessible. Uh, two, because that's a fundamental distortion in the market. What's sort of the, the, the consumer to, to, to determine where their capital goes? goes. You don't necessarily uh, want it to be driven by government regulation. Why is this relevant here, Romaine? It's because you have the bankers telling Congress that if you squeeze us on capital rules, the activity will move outside the system. And you have a former member of the private funds industry here, and now a senator, saying that is likely to be true, and that industry is also likely to face more regulation. His note comes with a caveat, though, and you heard it in the hearings. It is that the bankers need to do their job as being bankers, and rather than uh, engaging in politics here, yeah. he's very concerned about the woke in banking. The but woke -ism. to your point, okay. the woke is All right, Shanali uh, Basic, uh, uh, down in uh, Washington, D.C., we're going to have to leave it there. Let's continue the conversation here about some of those regulatory issues and get right to it with Alexandra uh, Barrage. She's a former executive uh, over at the FDIC and now a partner over at Davis Wright uh, Tremaine uh, in their financial services practice. And I, uh, Alexandra, I do want to get right to the heart of the regulatory argument here. I mean, the banks make a compelling argument about, well, existing regulatory regulations, and at least in their view, are enough, and that a lot of the new regulations that seem to be on the table really haven't been assessed with regards to not only the impact on the banks, but the impact on the economy itself. 
Yeah, thanks, Romaine. I think that's a great point. I think on the one hand, uh, you know, these CEOs are concerned that not enough analysis and data um, has been gathered in order to really understand not just the consequences to the U.S. economy, but of course the consequences to the U.S. consumer. The regulators recently put out a QIS, or basically a survey to these banks. Banks uh, that, that, you, that we're testifying today are undergoing um, that survey and answering those very detailed questions uh, in the hopes that regulators can have a better picture of those consequences. Um, so the data analysis and rigor is happening after. Uh, the proposal typically it, it usually goes the other way. Yeah. Um, but in any event, regulators are open to looking at that data. This is, we know something is probably going to come. I mean, whether it's actually smart regulation, that's a whole other topic of conversation. But go back to the tail end of the financial, global financial crisis, and some of the regulations that came out of there, whether it's Dodd-Frank, some of the Basel Accords, et cetera, here. That did actually, as J.D. Vance was getting at, push a certain amount of business outside the purview of traditional banks into private capital. And I'm wondering, when does that become a concern for lawmakers and regulators? Look, I think that's been a historical concern. Uh, back to the you know, shadow banking discussion uh, coming out of the great financial crisis. And the truth is, as more risk migrates outside of the bank regulatory perimeter, that's just less oversight by these banking regulators over that activity. So it's not as if the risk goes away, it just moves and potentially grows uh, in an environment that the regulators don't really understand and don't have a ton of transparency into. The regulators don't understand, don't necessarily have transparency into, but I'm curious, as someone who used to work at the FDIC, how does an agency like that consider or, or fold in or factor in the role of non-bank lenders in, in the banking system at this point? I think it's a great question. I mean, certainly a lot of the mortgage lending has now been dominated by non-banks. I mean, those are that's supported by years and years of data. And so what I think the FDIC and other bank regulators try their best to do through, um, you know, institutions like FSOC is try to really get at understanding and getting data around that uh, that activity that technically is outside of their of their purview. So they struggle with this, and they've been very public about the potential risks of the of the non-bank sector uh, and that non-bank sector doing more bank-like activities. So uh, it's definitely something they've been concerned about for, for years. Yeah, absolutely. So as we wrap up this conversation on the bank CEOs testifying here, was any of today's hearing actionable? Does it compel any member of Congress to push regulators to perhaps loosen some of the rules on capital requirements? I think what today's uh, hearing really did is underscore the importance of taking a closer look at the Basel proposal, both in terms of its potential consequences, uh, particularly on lending and the cost of capital. Uh, regulators have been open to looking at that data. They will be looking at that data. should be coming in the next few weeks. Um, and so I think for, for everyone, and certainly for me, what that discussion really uh, underscored was more attention and more rigor around the analysis and the impact. So we're likely to see a proposal that I think looks different uh, from the proposal we saw in July, particularly around impacts to mortgage lending mm. uh, and small businesses. So it perhaps does move the needle. All right. Thank you so much, Alexandra Baraj, FDIC former associate director. From New York, this is The Close on Bloomberg. Let's dive in today's Bloomberg Big Take. It's an investigation into the impact of Russian sanctions on uh, its economy. It turns out Moscow's monthly income from oil exports is greater now than before the invasion of Ukraine. Let's take a look. The energy world is completely turned upside down by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We see the rise of what's called the shadow fleet. New ship owners, new shipping companies that we've never encountered before. The sanctions that have been taken are effectively being dodged by those that are willing to actually participate. This right here is the Shadow Fleet. Somebody is doing something to make that ship appear somewhere else. To actually see clandestine behaviour was really surprising. That makes you think, well, what else is going on?
uh, some great uh, documentary work going on right now and a great story on the Bloomberg Terminal about how Russia has evaded U.S. and European sanctions. Julian Lee joining us right now, Bloomberg oil strategist. And Julian, let's get right down to it. This shouldn't be that much of a surprise. I mean, we've had a history of this with Iran and Venezuela and a few other rogue states as well here. It just seems like Russia is kind of pulling the same playbook that other folks have pulled in the past. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's pulling quite a, a similar playbook. Um, the, the, the whole sanctions regime is is quite different. I mean, the the sanctions against Iran and and against Venezuela uh, were explicitly designed to shut off the flow of oil from those countries. Uh, what's been done with with Russia is is almost exactly the opposite. The the aim has been to keep the oil flowing. Uh, but to reduce the amount of, of money that is filtering back to the Kremlin to, to fund its war in Ukraine. Um, the way that, that Russia has been getting around this is um, by developing this shadow fleet of, of tankers. And this is a, 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 an increasingly large fleet of generally elderly vessels, many of which have, have reached a point where they would normally get broken up. Mm. Um, and these have been bought by little-known companies, many of which have emerged in the last year or so. They're uh, located in places that are far away from uh, the eyes of, of Western governments. Right. And th their ownership is shadowy. And they have been moving this oil on behalf of Russia. So, Julian, that begs the question, where is the oil going? Who are the top buyers? Well, ultimately, it's it's going into refineries in China and India, mostly. Um, but in order to get there, uh, we've seen the emergence of a, a, a group of uh, little-known trading companies. I mean, these are companies that, you know, a year ago either didn't exist or, or maybe two years ago didn't exist. Um, and certainly, if they did, nobody had heard of them. They were virtually dormant. And they have, have sprung up and are... Um, dealing with vast amounts of Russian crude that was previously sold uh, for the Russians by some of the, you know, the biggest trading houses based in Geneva uh, who were very open and transparent. Uh, these companies are very secretive. Uh, their links um, are little known. They seem to be, each of them, allied quite closely to yeah. individual Russian oil producers. Yeah. And they are handling very large volumes of Russian crude. All right, Julian, going to have to leave it there. This is a real fascinating story that you and Alex and uh, Alaric uh, wrote, and really uh, the, the accompanying footage of it, uh, really uh, boots on the ground, if you will, or on the water, if you will. Uh, Bloomberg out there with cameras watching these ships uh, refuel. Absolutely stunning here and maybe indicative of the failure of some of those caps that the European governments and the U.S. government tried to impose. We'll be back in a moment. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close, just about 2.30 here in New York. And once again, Scarlett, it's really not about the stock market, not even really about the bond market. The biggest moves today, you're going to find that in the commodity space. Let's get right to it with Abigail Doolittle, who's standing by with our commodities close. Absolutely, Romain. Take a look at crude oil. WTI crude is down 4.1%. It's worst day since the middle of November, down for a fifth day in a row, the longest losing streak since February uh, 22nd of this year. And it seems that traders are clearly very disappointed by the production cuts, the $900,000 900,000 barrels per day. Uh, even Saudi Arabia is saying that it would extend past the first quarter, but apparently that's not enough. We have crude oil back below uh, $70 a barrel. This is a risk asset, so you could definitely see this as a drag on stocks fluctuating. Natural gas also lower, down 5.2%. Copper down 1.2%. But if you think natural gas and crude oil are bad, take a look at sugar. Sugar's down 7.9%. Uh, this doesn't just have to do with the fact that I've given it up for some time now. This is the worst day since 2011, as India uh, is perhaps going to consider using less sugar cane for its ethanol. So traders taking this very seriously. Again, the worst decline for sugar on a single day basis going back to 2011. As for crude oil, let's check in on the chart that we've been watching because now it's very clear that this was a big topping pattern and then this area of congestion initially on the OPEC production cuts started to break out. It was a false initial, initial reaction back down in and now very much on its way toward that target of about $65 per barrel or so, Romaine. The one thing this does is 
is uh, brings down the inflation worries uh, just as much as perhaps many people uh, would like to, along with rates coming in too. All right, another great wrap up by Abigail. And we should just point out, Scarlett, I think if we want to save the sugar market, we got to get Abigail back on sugar <laughs> because she, she's killing it. All right, I'll, I'll join her <laughs> in solidarity. All right, we're going to stay, I guess, in the energy space to a certain extent, particularly batteries. Fresh U.S. rules aimed at limiting China's grip on the lithium and the electric car market are proving to be less stringent than feared. That's why battery producers like Nanograph say it's important to streamline production right here in the U.S. There's a Chicago based startup out there that has shifted towards using materials like silicon for its batteries rather than graphite uh, as China pushes towards its own export controls. Uh, let's get right to it here with the CEO of Nanograph, Dr. Uh, Francis uh, Wong. Uh, great to have you here on the program, uh, Dr. Wong. Uh, I, I want to start off first with this general idea because someone sort of pitched this idea that Illinois and really the Midwest overall has become kind of this hub for battery innovation. And I'm wondering where do we stand right now, not just in terms of the innovation, but more importantly, a certain degree of independence. We're getting there. I think this is just still the early stages. Um, I think we're probably realistically looking at another five to seven years before um, we certainly can have a resilient U.S. battery supply chain. Well, what what are we doing right now? The, the, explain the technology that you're using. Uh, my general understanding, and, and just kind of explain it in layman's terms, uh, that it's basically a chemical that I guess provides what? A little bit longer lasting battery? Or is it smaller con containers? What is it? It's actually both. So um, Nanograph is a manufacturer of a material called a silicon anode. And a silicon anode, what it can do um, is it can significantly increase the energy density of a battery. It also can increase the power density of a battery. So for most users, for example, an electric vehicle, what that would mean is that they could drive up to perhaps 20 or 30 percent longer. Um, same thing with fast charging. You might see something like 20 percent increase in charge time. So it's an important material, and we've certainly had a lot of support from the both the Department of Defense as well as the, the U.S. Department of Energy um, in terms of being able to make sure that we produce this material in the U.S. And, and just very basically, how is this material produced? Is it mined? Is it produced chemically? I, I know that you are a chemist by training with a Ph.D. in chemistry from SUNY Stony Brook. Yeah, that's right. This is the particular variety of silicon um, we use uses um, what I'll call like a vapor deposition um, process to, to create this type of material. Um, so it, we can do this at low cost. Um, and we're beginning to show in, in Chicago here that we can produce this thing at scale. So the batteries that it produces, silicon oxide batteries, are those, will those be less prone to exploding and starting fires than lithium batteries? You know, unfortunately not. I think the, the mechanisms that um, take a battery into thermal runaway have nothing to do um, with the silicon anode. So I think those, um, those issues will still remain, at least with this technology. But there are a number of, um, for example, electrolyte technologies that are on the horizon that I think in the next three to five years, you're going to see things like thermal runaway go away. Yeah. Well, what type of customers are you signing up or what type of customers maybe are you looking to sign up? Yeah. So our beachhead market um, is the military. So we actually have this is one of the cells that we've been developing with the military. This this is actually the world's most energy dense cell. And our first um, customer beachhead market will be the military. Um, these cells will go into a number of different applications that soldiers will use out in the field and give them, for example, significantly longer communications times, up to eight hours out in the field. And very quickly, Dr. Wong, I know you started your career at the battery maker Duracell as a scientist. Would the, these batteries that you're looking to create eventually make their way to AA or AAA batteries that we use in smoke alarms? Um, probably not AA and AAA, but what I will say is that there there are initiatives within the U.S. government, particularly the military, where they're trying to standardize batteries. So um, one of the there is some momentum around creating other cylindrical cells and making those standards. Hmm. And that's all part of creating a more resilient um, supply chain, right? Not yeah. 20 different batteries, but maybe three. Yeah, that would be nice. Dr. Francis Wong, CEO of Nanograph, thank you so much for joining us today.
We've got a lot more coming up on the close. Take-Two investors hungry for the latest Grand Theft Auto trailer, but its release left some with a sour taste. We're going to talk to an analyst about why that is next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, time now for our top calls. The big movers on the back of analyst recommendations, and we could start off with Shake Shack. Raymond James upgrading the burger chain to strong buy. The analysts say the company is still in the early innings of driving improved margins. They also see the potential for increased foot traffic in 2024. Those shares up about 3% on the day. Next up, let's take a look at Discover. The analysts over at Bank of America upgrading to buy. Now, they say finding a permanent CEO, resolving compliance issues, and resuming share buy buybacks will aid the stock going forward. They also say the credit cycle is bottoming with a potential peak in delinquencies within three to six months, which is historically the time to get incrementally more bullish on credit card companies. Investors bullish, at least on the day, by about two and a half percent on Discover. And finally, let's take a look at work management software provider Asana, downgraded to reduce on the back of its earnings. This over at HSBC with analysts flagging a weak macro backdrop and stoking worries of sluggish growth. They expect these headwinds to push deeper into 2024 and put more pressure on valuation. Shares down 15% on the day, and those are some of our top calls. We do want to stay in the sell side space and go back just a little bit here. A closer look at Take-Two Interactive. The shares dipped a little bit yesterday after its Rockstar division posted the highly anticipated trailer for Grand Theft Auto 6. But before Scarlett goes out and tries to buy one, she needs to know she's going to have to wait a couple of years before it arrives, and that's assuming it arrives on time. But our next guest says the 2025 release date actually makes sense. Martin Yang, Emerging Technologies and Services Analyst over at Oppenheimer, joining us right now. He currently has an outperform rating on Take Two Interactive. All right, Martin, why don't you talk us off a ledge here? Why is this two year wait somehow not a bad thing? Sure. I think for uh, the publisher, Take Two, the two year wait is going to give them a larger install base of Gen 9 consoles, PS5, and Xbox Series S and X. That gives them a larger potential buyer uh, to purchase the game. And for the players, I think they are not uh, going to be disappointed given the uh, the kind of quality we have seen from the trailer. So it's better to get a game mm -hmm. uh, released in a very finished state as opposed to a game rushed out of the door with bugs mm -hmm. and um, uh, a lot of issues. Yeah, well said. I, I am curious about just the gap between uh, the current iteration of it and what we get in 2025 or whenever. Uh, so many games have come out since then, uh, competitive, competing games, or at least in that same general genre, that have included a lot more features, in-app features, in-game features, I should say, uh, social media features. Uh, and I'm wondering, do we have any sense, because I didn't necessarily get this from the trailer, do we have any sense as to just how much Rockstar is going to beef up those features in the next uh, version? Sure. I think I'll point out two things. One is something we can directly see from the feature, uh, from the trailer. Um, Rockstar devoted close to, you know, over 10% of the time in that 90-second trailer to social media clips, uh, body cam footage, and TV footage. You can always bet that those are very important part of the gameplay and the way they tell stories that have never been seen in other games. Another aspect which we can see from GTA 5 is they're using the phone as a very important in-game feature to communicate with other characters to manage your uh, daily stuff. And back then, when uh, Rockstar was developing GTA 5, you know, uh, over a decade ago, the phone and apps are nowhere as dominant in our current lives. So you can see that feature being enhanced in GTA 6 uh, will be a lot more innovative, expensive, and uh, a lot more interesting in terms of player and content interaction. Oh, so that's interesting that your phone becomes part of the game, part of the tool to play the game. And I ask that because you can play Fortnite on your game console and also on your mobile device, much to many parents' frustration. Would there be a day where Rockstar would make Grand Theft Auto 6 available to play on the PC, on your Android, or on your iPhone? Uh, in a medium-term feature, a future, I think that's possible, and think the most likely, um, or, or the earliest iteration of that would be uh, cloud gaming in one form or another, mm -hmm. uh, where you're playing a, 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 a version of the game custom built for PC and console, but on a smaller screen. But over time, you may be able to accommodate 
the, the scale and the technical complexity of the game on a smartphone eventually. Uh, but I don't think that will happen uh, within, let's say, two to three years of game release, having a iPhone native um, uh, version of GTA 6 because the game itself is so large in terms of scale, complexity, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the technical challenges iPhone is not able to accommodate just yet. All right, Mark. Or GTA 7. It's GTA 7, right. <laughs> and dropping in 2045. Martin, uh, this is actually really insightful here. Always uh, great to catch up with you. Uh, Martin Yang over Thank at you. Oppenheimer. A closer look here at Take Two Interactive uh, and uh, the two year uh, runway before we get uh, Grand Theft Auto 6. Stick with us here on the close. A lot more coming up, including a conversation with Randall Atkins. He's a chairman and CEO of Ramico. I'll talk a little bit about how AI plays a role in discovering rare earth elements. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. The host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joins us as he does every day at this time. And David, I think we're going to talk about rare earth. This is quite a yeah. story. I got to tell you, yeah. Romain. I mean, when this came on my radar, I was like, okay, this is going to be good. Well, yeah. some old yeah. gold mine out yeah, there yeah. shared in Wyoming. Yeah. It turns out it's worth more than a gold mine. Yeah. We've got the man who owns it. He is Randall Atkins. He's at Ramaco, founder, chairman, and CEO. So, Randall, thank you so much for being with us. Nice. Tell us this story, because it's sort of almost unbelievable that you had this unused or underused coal mine, and it turns out it may be worth a fortune. Well, it's, it's I describe it as kind of a 10-year overnight sensation. <laughs> uh, you know, we bought it an old coal mine sight unseen for a modest amount of money about 12 years ago. And uh, we tried to develop it as a thermal mine, uh, which made no sense. Uh, so we pivoted into essentially trying to find out what else could you use coal for. Mm -hmm. And that took us into an odyssey of essentially trying to develop and use coal as a precursor to make alternative carbon products. And that led us in, in turn to work with some of the national labs, uh, in particular NETL, which is the National Energy Technology Lab. They were the ones that then asked us for some samples of the, uh, the cores from the property and uh, came back to us after about a year and a half of uh, analyzing them and said, uh, we think we found something rather interesting we need to talk about. And uh, that's the story as it uh, began, and that's where we are today. And that gets you to the rare earth elements, as I understand Correct. it, which we need so badly as we make this climate transformation. But in the Wall Street Journal report on this, it said it was uh, about $2 million, and we were $37 billion, something like that. Where does a number like that come from? Is that a real number, $37 billion? So the, 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 first of all, the number didn't come from us. Uh, but I think the number was derived by essentially, you know, just taking the amount of tonnage we have and multiplying it by sort of a basket price of all the REs that we have. And we have, you know, a lot of the heavier uh, magnetic elements as well as the secondary elements and as well as two of the, uh, the critical minerals that have recently been banned by China, which is gallium and germanium. Um, so it does contain a, a basket of rather valuable uh, elements. Uh, and forgive me if this is an ignorant question, but I was always under the impression that we kind of knew that a lot of this stuff was sitting under U.S. soil to some degree mm -hmm. or another. It was just a matter of whether we had, A, the capability to mine it, and more importantly, whether regulations would allow it. That in part is true. I think uh, there are rare earth deposits in many places. Mm -hmm. The real trick is the concentrations of those mm -hmm. and then how they can be economically extracted and separated to actually create the product that can then be used to make magnets and electronics, et cetera. So that has been the challenge to really try to find where you had sufficient concentrations. Mm -hmm. um, they are formed, interestingly, by essentially volcanoes volcanic activity and come from the earth magma mm -hmm. in various uh, in manners. And so the NETL has done an assessment throughout the country as to where they might be found. And because of the volcanic activity that's sort of in the Powder River Basin in northern Wyoming, that's a particularly fertile spot for rare earths. Mm -hmm. uh, they're found in other parts of the country, but not in much concentration. So that's why our property seems to be rather unique. So what's next? I mean, how do you sort of, I guess, scale up to whatever the final 
final product is going to be? So it's a process, mm -hmm. and you know, finding it is 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 one effort. Uh, finding it and then involves doing a lot of subsequent chemical testing uh, to essentially determine how you can separate and extract this because rare earths are measured in parts per million. So you know, we're used to looking at coal seams that might be as tall as this room. Uh, here you're dealing with an area where you might have a mile's worth of cubic material and in it is contained rare earth in parts per million. So the trick is to be able to economically separate that. And that's, that's the quest that we're on right now, working with a number of the national labs as well to determine what's the most economic uh, way to extract. Do you have a sense, Randall, of the likelihood of being able to deliver? I mean, I noticed, for example, your largest shareholder, Yorktown, is mm -hmm. actually sold Sold some shares mm -hmm. this fall, and that right. sort of surprised me given this sort of phenomenon. Why would that be? Well, to answer the, the, the second question first, Yorktown, which is our largest shareholder, basically invested in us through a legacy fund that's now about 12 years old. So they're in the process of liquidating that fund, and they have sort of a set pattern to, uh, to distribute and sell shares. So that's the timing on that one. Um, and as to the first part of your question, you know, this process will take some time to, to ultimately uh, come to the point of the first commercialization of the, of the products. Um, but we anticipate probably within the next 12 to 24 months being in a pretty good position to analyze exactly which extraction techniques may be the right one to deploy. So Randall, my understanding is you didn't go into this as a rare earths element expert. That's not, that's not how you got here. But you've probably learned an awful lot since as a result of this process. Does your experience that you've had so far say anything to our strategic position as the United States in having rare earth metals. Picks up on Romaine's question, actually, because we've been very concerned about that, particularly mm -hmm. with respect to China and how many they have. So from our background, we are not obviously geologists in the rare earth space by training. So we relied sort of on the opinions of NETL. They regard this as probably one of, if not the most unique deposit they found in the continental U.S. And so we're kind of approaching this as a almost Team USA exercise where this could be a, a mine that could perhaps one day supply a meaningful amount of the supplies that this country needs and frankly do so by having it processed in sort of a mine to magnets area right there in Wyoming. Now, every time we bring a company founder or CEO on, and particularly this year, I should say, we have to ask them about any sort of link to artificial intelligence, as I'm sure you know that's all the rage. <laughs> but I'm told from David prior to this that apparently there is an AI component to this. There is. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, we yeah. started it this week, uh, which is a project that we've got with NETL, where we're doing AI machine learning to basically help determine and assess rare earth compositions within coal. Wow. And it's a, it's a machine that looks like a ray gun and uh, that can detect elements and we're trying to basically use AI to refine how that can be used to really uh, skip a few steps mm -hmm. that might otherwise be used in chemical analysis. Are you expecting the usefulness of that technology to accelerate, meaning as we learn more about AI and learn more about its applications that that will feed in to specifically I, what you do? I think you're absolutely yeah. right. Yep, yeah, it will. Let me go back to your original purpose, uh, coal, and particularly metallurgical coal, as I understand. That's mm -hmm. what you really are involved in. Mm -hmm. There's a good press for now for so-called green steel. Mm -hmm. What do you look at as the potential for metallurgical coal, mm -hmm. the demand for steel, and green steel? How do those all interact? So as far as green steel, you know, the, most of the commentary on that revolves around the use of hydrogen as a substitute for blast furnace steel uh, in some manner where coal is substituted for hydrogen. We've looked at that. Um, th the best advice we have been given is that it would probably take some time between now and 2035 to 40 to create a pilot plant to use hydrogen at a cost of about a trillion and a half dollars. So we do not lose a lot of sleep on uh, that particular alternative use. Although I think you know there are certain abatement techniques that can be used in steel plants, which can certainly, uh, you know, as I say, abate whatever emissions that are going on there. Yeah. But um, really, when I look at met, school, met Steel and Rare Earth, they're both part of what I would call critical materials, mm -hmm. because steel is now being, you know, used as a critical material behind most of the energy transition right. that we think about in uh, 
in windmills and solar. Randall, thank you so much for bringing this rather extraordinary story to us. That is Randall Atkins. He's Ramico, founder, chairman, and CEO. Tomorrow, we're going to go to Washington for an extended interview with U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. And then on Friday, we're going to hear from Larry Summers, former U.S. Treasury Secretary, on those November jobs numbers. That's coming at 6 p.m. New York time on Friday. And you can catch David Weston every day around this time right here on The Close, rounding out into the final hour of trading here on this Wednesday afternoon. A lot to cover, including the latest ADP data and that big drop that we've been seeing over the last few days in crude prices. Stick with us. This is a close on Bloomberg. It's about 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. Not a whole lot going on in equities, but there's a lot of action, or there was, in small caps. Everything's kind of faded as the afternoon has continued here as we wait for jobs on Friday. Yeah, obviously a big focus right now on some of the macro conditions. And yeah, the rinse and repeat that you're seeing right now in the equity markets are certainly something to be discussed. But I'm really fascinated by this move down that we've been seeing in crude over the last few yes. days. And this really does seem to be much more fundamentally driven. You're just talking about huge stockpiles building around the world. The demand just isn't there anymore right now, or at least the industrial activity isn't there that would mm -hmm. feed into that demand. And it really raises a lot of questions whether the NYMEX crude and Brent crude, for that matter, is signaling something that maybe the rest of the market isn't. Yeah, I mean, everyone's so hopeful that we're going to get this soft landing, but globally, you have to question uh, the demand picture here. Yeah. It's, it's pretty stunning to see WTI below $70 a barrel, I have and to it, say. And it gets to the idea of the underpinnings of the economy, whether they are sound. And we've been talking a lot this year about, uh, obviously, real estate, particularly when it comes to commercial real estate and office real estate and whether that's holding up. Uh, Blackstone Mortgage Trust, a stock we don't talk about a whole lot, uh, really plunging today, down about 7%. And this after we learned that Carson Block, of course, the famed short seller, uh, saying that uh, he is now basically shorting the stock. He said that uh, uh, the trust is facing a possible liquidity crisis and may default on its loans. Uh, he gave an interview a little bit earlier on a competing network, as well as with uh, some of our Bloomberg reporters kind of making the case here. And we should point out, you know, Blackstone has pushed back on this a lot, even prior to today. But you take a look at this chart here, and it's kind of hard to see here. But that yellow line at the bottom, yeah. that's office REITs. All of these lines right now are REITs, but you can see the differential that you're seeing with the ones at the top, which are largely some of the apartment buildings as well as some of the industrial uh, places. But when it comes to office REITs, are uh, still incredibly depressed. Incredibly depressed, although the REITs always get lumped into the same category, yeah. don't they? All right, let's take a look at uh, some individual movers here. Let's start with Citigroup. Uh, the shares at one point reached a nine-month high after the CFO said that the bank does remain on track to deliver full-year revenue in line with its earlier guidance, despite a slump in fourth-quarter trading revenue. Pretty tough telling that city reiterating its forecast is enough to send the stock higher. Yeah, I thought that was interesting because remember the stock initially dropped yeah. and then I guess people said, oh, okay, you not know, so bad. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, let's you take... had another one on there. Cigarettes. Is that still a thing? Yeah, it's still a thing. <laughs> Philip Morris, uh, Altria, take your pick. I picked Altria down as much as 3.8% after British American Tobacco rival said it's writing down the value of its U.S. cigarette brands, Camel, Newport, Palm Mall, yeah. by about $31.5 million. Because we're not smoking anymore. Well, people are vaping. Vaping. They've shifted. Okay. Yeah. I thought some of these companies were pivoting to vaping. That hasn't gone so well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There you go. And uh, Rent the Runway, also another loser today, down as much as 28%. The clothing rental company reported third quarter revenue and active subscribers that missed estimates and uh, price targets cut at Wells Fargo and Jefferies. Yeah. What's the future of this company? 59 cents a share right now. I know. It's not looking too and good. And it's still in the zeitgeist. It just doesn't necessarily have People a, use a it, growth but, and profitability. Uh, All right. We're sick with us here. We are getting ready to count you down to those clothes closing bells, our cross-platform coverage of today's top stories. That coverage starts now. Countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. 
Romain Bostic alongside Scarla Fu. We're joined right now by our colleagues, Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic. Welcome to our audiences in full across all of our Bloomberg platform, television, radio, originals, and our partnership for those folks streaming on uh, YouTube. Carol Masser, what are you watching today? Romain Bostic, I am watching this great and funny story, uh, interesting story out from uh, about Morgan Stanley and what their analysts were doing, apparently, uh, over the weekend. Uh, they spent, a bunch of them did, one in particular, uh, noticing joggers in Central Park and trying to really <laughs> get information about the kind of sneakers that they were wearing. And I think about like all the hedge fund dudes that are out there, right? And they kind of yeah. uh, rely on alternate data. My uh, Myself, I kind of have been watching and obsessed with Teslas that are in my neighborhood. It's an urban neighborhood, city neighborhood. They're parked on the streets, but I've just seen an increase. But anyway, Panic data. Joggers. I mean, you think, you think these Wall Street folks, it's all spreadsheets and Excel and computers and terminals Algorithm. and stuff. But, you know, they're out in Central Park doing anecdotal, looking at uh, looking at shoes. It actually reminds me of uh, back in 2018, uh, Michael Grimes over at Morgan Stanley. Do you guys remember when he was trying to win business for Uber's IPO? He actually came out and said that he spent years moonlighting as an Uber driver to try to win that business. That's yeah. research. But this is what analysts used to do. And I, I love this yeah. story. And I mean, I don't, I don't know how representative Central Park is for you know, the, that the broader sneaker yeah. market. But, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. Mall might be better, <laughs> But when right? I started my career, I mean, you know, you would talk to these, particularly on the retail retail side and look I mean they would just hang out at malls they would hang out in stores uh, you know remember when uh, S Silicon Valley and the tech scene was blowing up overseas remember analysts would go out there and count the number of cars in the parking lot yep. at seven o'clock at night to determine whether these companies were really working hard and, and, and innovating so some of that boots on the ground thing I mean obviously it's anecdotal data eff effectively but it does provide some value yeah. just I don't know Apple what? analysts used to go to the stores every time there would be a new Apple phone launch, right? And sit there and count how many people well, were there and one uh, of the check out how many phones they're buying. What shoes are you wearing, Carol? Uh, I have heels on. Three inch heels right now. Okay. But so you're not I will I will say sh we did recently interview the CEO of On. Uh, mm -hmm. on running yeah. and we both wanted to try the shoes Carol actually went out and bought a pair this weekend oh. uh, she wore them in today I gotta say that store was packed well that's a that's kind of one of the points of the story yeah. is that the barrier to entry in the competitive running shoe market is relatively low given the dominance of Hoka over the last few years and then upstarts like on I mean together those two brands at least according to this analyst uh, in Central Park account for more than uh, what they saw from Nike over the weekend in Central Park so yeah, pretty telling yeah yeah, it is pretty telling. So speaking of but dominance. that's just for runners, right? Yeah, just I mean, for runners. I mean, well, I mean, in fairness, some of these shoe sneaker companies get a lot more of their business from, you know, just people. I, I have a pair of pokers and I have no intention of running. Just people like, running, just people like Carol Masser who are just you know, like walking around. Like Carol Masser, yeah, you don't Yeah, mind, wearing you? your on sneakers to McDonald's no. or something. <laughs> I, I want to bring up McDonald's nice. because there's a great story here about how McDonald's is looking to turbo expand its locations. It's got about 41,000 restaurants or just over that amount. It wants to get to 50,000 locations around the world by 2020. That is an increase of 22% yeah. in a four-year span. I mean, are they going to change up the menu? I mean, I, do we not have enough McDonald's? What's wrong with McNuggets? I, I, they are perfect. I, I don't know what Carol Mass is talking about, but can we <laughs> talk about the, the jump from 41,000? I, I feel like we, we went down this road before. A couple CEOs ago, I can't remember the guy's name, but he tried something similar. It was basically like, we need to expand our footprint. Mm -hmm. and, you know, was this expansion of footprint comes, comes with a certain degree of costs, so you have to do it smartly, and it obviously did not work out, and he hmm. is not there anymore. Sorry, go ahead, Carol, with your nuggets. Nothing. I just, you know, I was talking to Tim about recently stopping kind of in search of a bathroom on you, a road trip, and I stopped in a McDonald's. McDonald's uh, between here and Washington and or Virginia and it was gorgeous like they have redone them yes I really do think that they have been working around their menus in a big way to kind of um, reach some of the food changing food trends that are out there they've I, removed all those orange and yellow chairs that look like the New York City subway right? and replaced it with stainless well, steel and like some faux wood paneling cool, right and they're also experimenting with different formats that are you know drive-through only or to Julie help with ordering this stuff online I learned I don't know if you guys know this. I learned that Happy Meals aren't just for kids. Carol told well, me this. I, well, I found this out. You know why? Because a couple of our producers uh, were like ordering them like a couple weeks ago because there was some, I don't know, there was some toy that they all wanted. <laughs> and I was like, what? They years, all, they all brought something? I had no they, idea. Years ago, they had baby beanie babies. Baby it was beanie crazy. Babies. You're really dating yourself, Carol. Do you remember when I'm, during I'm the Olympics when they had the little um, tabs that you could scratch off to see if uh, the U.S. was going to win? I, I'm oh, now wait, really I'm sorry. dating myself. Carol's not dating herself. <laughs> Scarlett's dating herself. Because I do remember that. I think I was about two years old okay. when, <laughs> when that happened. But I also. That was a really big deal. But I used to family. beg my mother to collect <laughs> those, but she just wouldn't. <laughs>
so. I'm just saying it's kind of interesting. We'll see whether or not that uh, growth vision works. All right, um, so we'll see you guys in 2027. Quack, quack, we'll be waddle, back. Waddle. This was quack, fun. Quack, waddle, waddle, quack, quack, waddle, waddle. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that was kind of precious. All right, we're going to be back in less than an hour's time. We're going to count you down at the close on this Wednesday, Radio TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. Join us for Beyond the Bell. And we continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television, counting you down to the close here on this Wednesday afternoon. Just about 50 minutes to go, and who better to talk to than Rob Arnott, chairman of Research Affiliates, joining us right now uh, to count us down to those closing bells. And, Rob, I want to look a little bit more, uh, I guess, long-term and not necessarily in some of the incremental moves that we've had over the last few days and weeks. But there has been a trend line forming when it comes to what investors are most interested in, at least in the equity space, and whether we get to a point where people are willing, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, to go out on a limb and maybe try something a little bit different than just, you know, the magnificent seven stocks or whatever small basket that, uh, that has sort of driven this rally. Well, uh, I think it's going to happen. Uh, the only question is when. Uh, we're in the only major business in the global macro economy where people hate bargains. Uh, just imagine if Tiffany's posted a banner sign saying Christmas special, 50% off. And then across the street, um, <clears throat> uh, you had uh, 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 a different uh, jeweler posting a sign saying uh, 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 particularly high quality, 50% um, above last year, and people were pounding down the door to get into the second store and, and, and fleeing Tiffany's in droves. Uh, that's the way the markets tend to function. People hate bargains because bargains got there by inflicting pain and losses. People mm -hmm. love what's newly expensive because it got there by creating joy and great profit. And the result is you have things like Magnificent Seven is now uh, those seven companies collectively are now worth more than the four largest economies in Europe. Think about that. Yeah. Seven companies, <clears throat> which the market is saying are more important to the global future of the economy than the four largest economies in Europe. Now, I get it that Europe um, uh, has regulatory regimes that tend to stifle innovation. Yeah. But still, what? come on. The other thing that's interesting is that value relative to growth is the third cheapest in history. The only time it was cheaper was peak of the tech bubble in 2000 and yeah. the aftermath of COVID in the summer of 2020. Yeah. So value represents an enormous bargain. It, it represents an enormous bargain. And I, I want to go back, though, to your analogy about, because I thought that was good, about the uh, jewelry stores uh, across the street from each other. As I'm sure you know, there's market psychology and the idea that if you see a crowd lining up outside a store or outside anything, you look, you want, you want, oh, they must know something I don't, right? That must be the hot new thing. And we see that obviously play out in the market. And I'm wondering, is there ever really a historical, uh, I guess, comparison where that wisdom of the crowds did truly gravitate in mass uh, to value in a way where value became momentum? Oh, yes. Think of the aftermath of uh, the 2000 tech bubble. Value outperformed by over a thousand basis points per annum for the next seven years. In fact, Russell value was higher in the spring of 2002 than it was at the market peak in the spring of 2000. Value had gone up in a bear market. It suffered a short, sharp bear market in uh, second and third quarter of 2002. And then it, re then it rebounded handily to new highs within six to 12 months. And in terms of relative valuation, it went from what was then the deepest discounts ever to the shallowest discounts by the summer of, two, of 2007, the shallowest discount seen since the 1970s, meaning that value was very fully priced. So value was momentum. Remember back in August of 2007, we had the quant crash where uh, quant high-flying stocks, which tended to be value, tended to be value, momentum, quality, these stocks uh, were reaching high levels of relative valuation relative to their own history. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was a, a value momentum market. Last year was a bit of a value momentum market. After, after a period of time, value was so strong that value was momentum. 
Yeah, but the momentum for value seems kind of fleeting these days, and oh, it's, yeah. it's been a tough slog for value stocks in general. And one thing you point out is that while value stocks have had a big drawdown, the worst drawdown ever, value companies, their fundamentals are just fine. They're growing, um, and they're doing everything they're supposed to. How does the stock performance hold back the business, hold back the operations of the business then? In general, that linkage is rather weak. Um, it does uh, uh, impede morale. Uh, if you're working at a company that's doing just fine, but uh, share prices are down, uh, it impedes morale at senior levels. So that's one area where the, there is an interplay. Mm. But it's really interesting. If you look at the uh, century to date, this century to date has been bad for value, mostly because of um, uh, values underperforming since 2007. But this century to date, the earnings on the Russell 1000 value index have risen more than the earnings on Russell growth. The underlying companies have done better than growth. What a shocker. Yeah, but you won't see it in the performance of the stock price. So how do you harness that, that better performance operationally in terms of The profits? performance of the stock is a combination of the performance of the business, mm -hmm. plus or minus the changes in relative valuation. So when value falls out of favor and gets cheaper relative to its underlying fundamentals, the performance of the stock is poor, even if the performance of the business is just fine. That's been the pattern this century, most particularly from 2007 to 2020. We saw a wonderful snapback from uh, summer of 2020 through year end 2022. Yeah. And then this year came along and the AI narrative just took over. And with the AI narrative taking over, values underperformed growth this Absolutely. year to date or yesterday by 3,000 basis points. Rob, uh, very quickly here, speaking of uh, narratives that are taking hold, the narrative taking hold of the market right now is the Fed is going to pivot and cut rates. You disagree. You disagree and believe that inflation could even finish the year higher at 4%. Make the case quickly here. Sure, sure. Um, this is all down to a base effect. Uh, November and December of last year, we had deflation. Prices were going down, not up. Uh, in order for inflation to stay right where it is, uh, we will have to see deflation in November and December. Now, Cleveland has a now cast for inflation that suggests that this month will be minus a tenth of a percent. If we return to the norms of the last three years with, let's say, 40 basis point inflation in December, that's going to take us to just under 4% inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not of the view that the Fed is poised to raise rates again, but I am of the view that inflation is slightly more likely to surprise to the upside than the downside, and the narrative in the market is inflation's done. Yeah, and as a result, you see the possibility of additional rate hikes later uh, this year as well. All right, uh, Rob Arnott, Research Affiliates Chairman, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, something to keep in mind here. We've got a lot more coming up on the close. We're just about 45 minutes away from the closing bell. The professor who found a widely used formula for predicting bond market returns is wrong. We're going to talk with the doctoral student who did the research and uh, found some interesting problems with that research. Yeah, looking really forward to that conversation and looking forward to after the bell where we get results out of GameStop. Don't call them earnings because they probably aren't going to be that, but we will have a full breakdown of whatever they report when they report it. Just numbers. How about that? And shares of YG Entertainment skyrocket in Seoul after all four members of Blackpink renewed their contracts with the K-pop agency. Wow. Yay. This is The Close. I'm Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Muni moment. And our next guest says for investors in the top brackets, high quality tax exempts are attractive right now. That's at least compared with investment grade corporates as well as treasuries. Stephanie LaRosillier joining us right now, head of municipal business strategies over at Invesco. All right, Stephanie, make the case here. I mean, I was looking at the price action myself. It looks like a lot of people are now uh, sort of waking up to the idea that there is value to be found there. Why? 
So I think really investors the last two years has really taken a lot of steam out of folks. And we completely understand that, you know, what the Fed has done has really been at the forefront of what's driven the market. And, uh, you know, I always talk about munis being so idiosyncratic, so credit focused. We haven't had the opportunity for that credit to shine and for prices to reflect the positive momentum that we've seen in credit fundamentals. And now we find ourselves uh, sort of coming back from that. And munis are at 10, 20 year highs when it comes to yields. And then when we look at, you know, tax equivalent, even on our high-grade, low-duration products, we're talking over 6% tax-equivalent yield. So what are the, what's the setup as we um, get ready to close out the year? The technicals for December are supposed to be favorable to Muniz. They are. They are. So we're looking at probably about net negative issuance of about $5 billion, And then we're talking about about $15 billion of, of coupons actually coming to market. So that's a net uh, $20 billion that should be coming back into the market. And a lot of that, you know, we saw that last month as well. So November was, uh, you know, I wouldn't say surprise to the upside. We sort of expected it, but it was even better than we could have expected. Um, and now, you know, ending this year out, we think December is going to close us out also on a positive note. Uh, of course, I mean, the muni market isn't a monolith. Stephanie, there have to be opportunities and there have to be places that you want to avoid. Are there places right now that you look to where you find maybe uh, to be a little bit more attractive? Yeah, so when we look at sort of what's happening in the economy and we look at where uh, we're continuing to see, see spurred activity, we continue to see some positives uh, in the transportation sector. Um, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the pent up travel that folks still have post COVID. Um, you know, you see the airports and a lot of the large regional airports as well as international airports are so busy these days. I mean, you know, you saw the headlines around Thanksgiving and now going into, you know, the Christmas, Hanukkah and year end holidays. So transportation is a sector we really like. Uh, you know, we've also, we're not a big buyer of GOs, but we must say that when it comes to the fundamentals at the state and local levels, mm -hmm. uh, we've actually seen such positive momentum that we are also finding some opportunities there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say, you know, when it comes to us, we like the essential services. We also like some high yield. Um, there are certainly some spots in the healthcare hospital sector that we like, but you have to be very careful there. Higher education, you also have to be a little bit careful there, but that's really why, you know, we have a team of 24 analysts that make sure we know exactly what's going on uh, in those underlying credits. All right, so a number of different areas where there could be some opportunities. Stephanie, really appreciate your joining us. Stephanie LaRusselier, Head of Municipal Business Strategies over at Invesco. We've got much more ahead. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to the close. Just about uh, a little more than 30 minutes before we get to those bells, Scarlett. Uh, and kind of an interesting day once again. Obviously, you have the similar price action in the equity space. You talk about the, the big moves that we continue to see in treasuries, mostly on the longer end of the curve. But I'm still fascinated by the big moves that we're seeing in commodities today, particularly in oil. Yeah, oil prices, if you look at WTI, uh, below $70 a barrel. And this is even as Russia is flouting all these um, restraints. Constra Constra uh, constraints, restraints, same yeah. word, right, put on it. Yeah. And there's plenty of supply out there. And the question really now comes down to demand, what that looks like heading into 2024 and whether there's too much supply for the demand that's expected to slow down. Yeah, and it gets to this idea, too, about kind of the underpinnings of the global economy. We know there's softness in China. We know there's softness in a lot of the sort of uh, industrial economies. Uh, obviously, here in the U.S., where we're much more service-oriented, we're a little bit insulated from that for now. But again, the key phrase is for now. Yeah, but falling oil prices does provide some relief for anyone who's looking for inflation to slow down further as what, well. What did you make of the ADP report this morning? And I know its predictive powers aren't all that, but I mean, it had to be a little concerning to see a number come in that soft. Yeah, but it's consistent with the narrative we have so far, which is cooling labor market overall. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that it's going to say anything about the jobs report. The jobs report has to account for the fact that people came back from work from the UAW strike. Yeah, yeah, good point, too. And uh, so uh, obviously, and that's going to be the big report on uh, Friday afternoon, uh, Friday morning. And excuse me, the big government job support. Stick with us. We're back in a moment. This is Bloomberg.
This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes left to go here in the trading day, Scarlett. And we're looking at another day of modest moves here in the major equity indexes. Let's start with the S&P 500. We're going to look at the chart behind us. Uh, it's a big pie, and you can see pretty much mixed day, although energy uh, down 1.6%, and that is as oil prices seemingly have collapsed. Uh, WTI is trading below $70 a barrel. All 23 members within energy are lower on the day. Tech and financials also in the red, and you can see that's why the uh, big chunk of the pie is red. What's bucking the decline at the moment? Utilities, of course, your classic uh, safe haven, industrials, and healthcare, although healthcare at this point is just marginally higher. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back uh, down uh, to energy at the bottom of your screen there, Scarlett. And that's at the top of the screen here. Obviously, a lot of this is tied to the downdraft in oil prices, down 4% just on the day. But remember, you go back to some of those highs that we saw in late uh, September here, and we're down by a significant margin, double digit percentages since then here. This is despite the that ExxonMobil actually announced an increase in its stock buybacks by about 14%, but that's not enough to save it, down a percent and a half on the day. Halliburton and some of the oil field services companies also moving lower here on the day. But two bright spots to keep an eye on. One, airlines. Delta Airline president was speaking at that Morgan Stanley conference, said demand for the Christmas holiday season is, in his words, very, very, very strong. The shares having a very, very strong day. And Dave and & Buster's came out with some interesting guidance as well. Apparently, we're still going out eating and playing playing those shares moving higher, Scarlett, by 4%. By 4%. All right. We'll keep an eye on those movers as we gout you down towards the close. In the meantime, we want to move on to our next guest because he's the co-author of a paper that has left the worlds of academia and high finance reeling. Because when he was studying at Warwick Business School in England, Alex Dickerson discovered that a widely used formula for predicting returns in the bond market was flawed. Alex is now an assistant professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And I'm pleased to say Alex joins us now. Alex, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, before we get your research and what it looks into, which is basically factor investing in the bond market, uh, the way that someone might use factors in the stock market, when you discovered that this formula that so many people were relying on and were citing was wrong, how many times did you recheck your math and redo the work? Yeah, so at the end of the day, we have these sort of underlying signals that are trying to predict returns ex ante, right? So in the future, so one month ahead. And what these bond systematic credit strategies would do is that they would they would extrapolate from what you saw in the stock market, right? Which is super liquid, it trades on a, on a limit order book. And they would apply the, the exact same techniques verbatim, right? So when I was checking the code, I primarily code in Python. I checked myself, it was checked by my colleagues, um, and what was quite scary is that many of the quants in industry actually knew about these flaws, right? So it wasn't just myself. And the paper itself was um, was published in a, in a sort of a top three journal. So what your viewers should know about this is these top three journals are very competitive to get into. It's about a 1% to 5% acceptance rate. And it turns out that the majority of the results in this paper was fundamentally flawed, right? And this had sort of a knock-on effect in that it was cited over 200 times, and it essentially laid the framework to build incremental knowledge in factor investing for corporate debt, right? Now, this was sort of a, a big issue in academia, and it really speaks to what we sort of deem the replication crisis, yeah. which is really that if you look at medicine and in psychology, if you look at top corporate bond papers that write about investment factors, the majority of them... Um, published in top journals cannot be replicated, right? which is in a way catastrophic for our work because as a scholar or as an academic and in, in, in industry as well, we want to build on this work and make it sure. better. But if the groundwork is completely faulty, then we have a problem. So you mentioned that others had also noticed it was flawed. Why had no one made a big deal about it up until that point? So this is a very difficult question for me to answer. Um, it would require a very nuanced, long answer, but essentially, um, the, the authors involved were, were very well known, right? So it would essentially be a very small guy calling out someone who's extremely established. Now, the risk to your career from doing that would be, could possibly be catastrophic. So for myself, my co-authors, it worked out okay in that um, the journal editor at the JFE was very sympathetic to our cause, but the risk of calling someone out in this manner could be catastrophic to one's career. So we were very careful in our execution. The, the idea of the paper was not to call out this paper. It was to really relay the groundwork for future work to make things better. 
um, so to speak. Yeah, and, and that's a good point, too. And, and I'm curious, Alex, too, when we talk about, uh, the, A, the fact that they were actually willing to sort of go back and say, OK, let's pull this down. But then the subsequent report uh, that, that you were just referencing here, it gets to an underlying question, really, about active management, particularly when uh, passive strategies are so dominant. And I know there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence here that you can't really outperform some of these passive markets here. Yeah. Is there actual empirical yeah. data to support that? Yeah, so that's a really good point. So in my new paper, it's called the Low Frequency Trading Arms Race. Now, the problem with corporate debt is that it trades OTC. Up until about the last two or three years, the majority of corporate bond trades happen with the dealer, right? So think of stock market, but extremely illiquid. Um, bonds trade roughly four or, five, four or five times a month, right? So we essentially designed some software where we properly backtest over 200 systematic strategies, right? Now, this is quite salient right now because we see this massive push from systematic credit investors who are trying to sell this product that, you know, we can generate you alpha, we can help perform. If you are pragmatic and you let the data speak truly, um, and normally the data doesn't lie, we show that these systematic credit factors are systematically losing investors' money. Right now, this is um, from the data. If we look at mutual funds, we look at about 1,000 funds. On average, these funds, relative to a net of cost passive benchmark, are losing systematic credit investors roughly a million dollars. Um, in aggregate per month, right? Yeah. So the results are really quite catastrophic, and it's a really strong pushback against this notion that these highly illiquid debt markets can provide alpha to investors, right? So that's sort of a key point. Yeah, but I mean, as I'm sure you know, at least certainly here in the U.S., there has been a big push down this road now uh, to sort of create more of these uh, credit products uh, in a way that, I guess, makes people feel like that there is something, uh, so some degree of alpha, I guess, baked into uh, the cake here. Is there a sense here that the marketing, and let's just be honest about it, that the marketing itself will win out over maybe some of the more, I guess, let's just call it common sense? If we're brutally honest, yeah, these funds spend millions of dollars to try and market themselves as they can outperform sort of a passive market benchmark. Right now, we've seen this in equities for the last 20, 30 years. For these funds to consistently, and I think that's a key word, we're certainly not saying that active management is um, doesn't have a place. It certainly does. But if we look at corporate debt, the hurdles to, to jump over to generate your client's alpha is astronomical, right? And especially in the last 20 years, when the majority of this debt is extremely liquid, these bonds never trade to actually generate and trade on monthly signals after transaction costs is 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 exceedingly difficult. Alex, really appreciate your uh, stepping in and explaining all of this. It's quite a story. Um, and of course, it was written by Justina Lee on the Bloomberg. Uh, Credit Quants left reeling after the research that you did um, indicated there was some questionable data, flawed data in uh, what had been seminal research. Alex Dickerson is assistant professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Thank you. Coming up, we've got our top three, our new segment where we focus on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. There's a music theme this time. This is The Close. I'm Bloomberg. It's time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we do a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. And Romain gets us started. Who do you have your eye on? Well, let's start off with Smile Direct Club. I'm sure you're familiar with them. I mean, this was a high flying stock. It's the really Invisalign come down. Guys, right? or filing some, for back. Like yeah, smiling, filing for bankruptcy. And now we're learning that the founders of this company, uh, Jordan Katzman and Alex Finkel, are now basically trying to take the business back. Basically, they have raised some cash. They're willing to shell it out and basically buy this company out of bankruptcy. And I guess uh, do for it, uh, I guess what they couldn't do prior mm. uh, to this. But I mean, this was a huge fall from grace. If you remember, and this was like the hottest trend for a while. It was yeah. like the Wagovi of its time, if you will. And then all of a sudden, it just more options came onto the market. Uh, there was a lot of pricing competition, and they just couldn't hack it. Uh, but these guys, uh, of course, uh, were kind of pushed to the sidelines because of the bankruptcy. Now, basically saying, this is our company, and we want it back. We want to take control. By yeah. the way, I was just looking into this Align, which is the larger rival yeah. of the, you know, within this space. Mm -hmm. um, analysts were saying it faces a really challenging macro environment because there are fewer adult patients starting an orthodontic program right now. Yeah. Kids will always get braces because, you know, they're developing and everything, but yeah. for adults, it's discretionary and they're not doing Absolutely. that right now. Yeah, and it's not cheap. No, And not it's not all. covered by, for most people, it's not covered by Absolutely. Insurance. All right, the person I'm watching here, our second uh, person I'm watching is Enrique Iglesias. He is the Latin singer and the son of Julio Iglesias, in case you didn't know who Enrique was. Enrique agreed to sell his recorded music catalog to Influence Media Partners, which is a firm backed by Warner Music 
Music and BlackRock. Now, uh, this company will manage all of Enrique's recordings, as well as the names, uh, his the rights to his name, image, and likeness. Mm -hmm. The value of the deal not to close, but supposedly he collected nine figures. Uh Wow. Oh, well, I guess that's not surprising. I am curious about uh, these artists that are the base are selling away their rights, particularly when they're still relatively young. I mean, I know he's. We were talking during the break. He's forty-eight. He's forty-eight so years he, old. So he's not a you know he's not a kid anymore. But at the same time, he's in theory he's still got a pretty good career ahead of him. He he is working on a new album, a final album. Yeah. Um, that he says will be it. A final album. A final. Is that album. like when Jay Z came out with? The yeah, final album? exactly. I mean, they and say it's final, like but who knows? Yeah. yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. But um, and he's been on tour recently with Pitbull and Ricky Martin. Oh yeah. Yeah. Huh? Okay, Our producer right. knows, knows all right. this tour. Well, let's uh, stay uh, in the music space and actually go to our third uh, person of the day, and it's actually people, Scarlett, Jenny, Lisa, Jisoo, and Rosé. Who are we talking also about Also known as Blackpink, ah. the, the K-pop phenom, uh, phenomenons. There was a lot of rumors here that this group was going to break up. They had refused to sign their contract. Some people had said that only Rosé was going to uh, sign the new contract. Now YG Entertainment has confirmed that all four members have agreed to... Uh, so we'll continue with the company here yep. because of, and I'm going to quote this, because of, quote, song trust. Song trust. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Maybe something's lost in translation, but I guess they uh, managed to sort out, uh, uh, I guess, some sort of working arrangement, and I'm sure uh, quite a few bucks as well. Yeah, I, I believe the YG um, Entertainment, which is the K-pop agency that represents yeah. them, the stock had plunged more than 50% from its high in May because yeah. there was speculation that Lisa, and I'm not sure which one of these yeah, don't women ask me are which Lisa, is who is who, but. might leave the group. But as it turns out, like you said, you know, relief for everyone involved and Blackpink fans, uh, they have all agreed to sign on. And, and I was looking, there were some great uh, numbers about just how much money K-pop mm -hmm. makes, but also the investment that like places like YG and these other talent agencies put into these groups. Oh, yeah. They say on average to create one of these sort of either girl groups or boy groups, for lack of a better word, uh, in the K-pop scene, basically the equivalent of about 1.3 million U.S. dollars just to get them up and running. And so there's, and obviously more additional investment in that. So there was a lot of sort of back and forth as to where the the real value is. Yeah, is it yeah. the value in these four folks or is the value in the folks behind the scenes who always think that they're the real brains of the operation? Yeah, but you bring it to the fans. The fans don't care about the people behind the scenes. No, of course you not. Know? It's all about mean? Lisa and Jisoo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, who better to talk about it than us? <laughs> We're hip. <laughs> all right. Uh, we are kind we of appreciate <laughs> the people behind the scenes. They, they make this complete. All right, our three uh, uh, people of the day here as we move closer to the closing bell, a conversation with our fourth person of the day, not to be outdone by the three we just spoke about. Linda Dissel, Federated Hermes, Senior Equity Strategist, going to be joining the big program in just a second to help us count down to those closing. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarla Food. Just about 10 minutes until we get to those closing bells. It had been a mixed day in equity markets, Scarlet, but over the last few minutes here, all the major indices right now in the U.S. flipping into the red. Yeah, flipping into the red, and you're talking about the Russell 2000, the S&P 500, the Nasdaq. That's not really where the real action is, and it's not in the bond market either for a change, uh, although yields have come down four basis points on the 10-year. It's in the oil market. NYMEX crude, WTI trading below $70 a barrel. I, this is the momentum. The momentum is clearly to the downside. There's some concern that algorithms are exacerbating uh, the trading here. Yeah, yeah, well, algorithms, and there's been a lot of talk about uh, the CTAs, uh, sort of the high-frequency traders who uh, are using both algorithms and not, and whether that's driving the move. But when you look at some of the fundamentals there, I mean, there does seem to be some justification for mm -hmm. the tamp down. Now, whether it should have gone from 93 bucks to 69 who knows? But uh, certainly uh, there was a case to be made that it should have been lower than where it was uh, back at that uh, peak. Yeah, plenty in, uh, of supply September. and the demand is questionable heading into 2024. And meanwhile, talk about flipping into the red here. Bitcoin now flipping into the red, yeah, after it, posting a pretty strong day and pretty strong couple days. Yeah, it had surpassed yeah. $44,000. Uh, a lot of hopes about Fed easing mm -hmm. and a spot Bitcoin ETF, which eventually will come to pass maybe in 2024. All right, let's get right to it. Linda Dissel joining us right now to help count down to the closing bells. Senior equity strategist over at Federated Hermes. And uh, Linda, I mean, we talk about, I guess, kind of the, uh, not cyclical, what's the word I'm looking for, seasonal. Uh, some of the seasonal factors that drive the market. And everyone always sort of looks to the Santa Claus rally at the end of the year. But we had a big rally in November. Uh, and I mean, I know it's kind of petered out just a little bit here in the first week of December. But I'm wondering what you made of those moves in November and whether you saw, I guess, real fundamentals underpinning that move higher. 
Well, I think the really interesting move in November was in the bond market, and I think that was the bond market saying we were wrong to think that it, that interest rates would go much higher here because uh, we started to see weakening in, not terrible weakening, but weakening throughout many of the economic statistics. So that was pretty strong right there. I mean, the, uh, we all have known about the Magnificent Seven in the stock market, and we really want to see uh, a breadth of advance in the rest of the market. But there, you saw some run-ups in the strong month of November that ran up against resistance. And that's when people say, I don't know if it's going to go through resistance, and you consolidate, which is probably what we're doing right now. Um, yeah. in, you know, in the beginning part of December, is continuing a consolidation after a super strong November. And it, and it wasn't super strong information. It was just inflation's coming down and we're weakening some. Yeah, and inflation's coming down and people seem to be buying into that narrative. They're also buying into the narrative, Linda, that some of the economic fundamentals will hold up. I mean, we've seen that in the GDP data. I know it's backward looking, but we've even seen that in some of the more, uh, I guess, in the moment consumer data coming out of uh, the Black Friday or at least the start of the holiday shopping season. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it does look uh, still as if the consumer some, is a group that you wouldn't want to bet against. We'll be watching the retail sales coming up pretty soon here to see if that if it really does hold true for the balance of the Christmas season in terms of, of the consumer. But I think what gets more interesting is we make our way to the end of the year. And, you know, we at Federated Hermes said 4,600. We've touched it already, as you know, but uh, we're in and around that now. We'll be starting to consider the next year and just a continued running out of that surplus money that we've all been spending just a continued uh, bleed of maybe the unemployment going up a bit more maybe we have a weaker jobs number this this uh, uh, this next figure coming out here soon and it's an election year and we start to talk about how sloppy election years can be yeah especially this coming election year with so many things up in the air I want to go back to oil prices and what looks like and again this is on the surface level a collapse in the price uh, below seventy dollars a barrel that is typically a, a tailwind for consumers because you know people start to feel a little bit better that uh, their gas prices will be a little bit lower especially in this current era of high inflation or at least persistent inflation um, we of course have to see oil stick at these levels but how do you see that playing into the outlook for equities well, anything that can help the consumer and that can show evidence of inflation coming down is good news for equities. Um, as we look into next year, what we really want to see for equities is profit margins holding up. They really have surprised this year. We'd love to see another quarter of that, uh, you know, to, to the extent that uh, energy is uh, is one of the expenses in any company. Uh, that will be important. Obviously, as you said, to the extent that we see, everybody knows that's one one of the first things that we look at is the price of, of gas of, of gasoline in terms of our uh, consumer confidence and willing to keep on spending. That's just great news. That way, it's just another piece of a declining inflation number. But obviously, as we make our way into next year, and I don't know that 69 is the beginning of a of a figure that's going to keep going down. That should evidence recession, and we just don't see that. Mm. So you should you should probably, as as you suggested, there's some trading going on here that might be exacerbating yeah. the situation from the energy patch. You had mentioned we're in this period of consolidation. Some people are calling it a pause period before the Fed really decides what path to take, whether uh, to hold at these levels or to eventually pivot. What is the best way to proceed during this pause period? What should investors be thinking through? What should be on their checklist? What they should be watching for is uh, is the next earnings season, and if it looks pretty good and what the outlook will be, look for profit margins holding up. Look for the breadth of the names below the surface starting to do better, because if we don't see a recession, then earnings are still good. And we've been bidding up a handful of names all year long. That means the rest of the names are inexpensive. So we speak about the small cap trade. It's been very, it's very inexpensive. You know, it catches a bit of a bid, but then it loses steam. If we see that starting to catch up again, then we can say, you know what? There's going to be breadth here in this market. And we are looking, even though it's an election year, the first half of the year we think will be strong because we think the Fed will stay on hold. And as everybody knows, that's great news. You just you don't want to see them cut necessarily. What do they know? Is there something wrong with the, with mm. the market? And, and the unemployment situation, which is still good. It's still good. It's slowing, but it's still quite good. 
All right, uh, Linda, always uh, great to talk to you. Uh, Linda Dissel, and just in case we don't see you before the end of the year, uh, have a wonderful uh, Christmas, a wonderful holiday season. Linda Dissel, Senior Equity Strategist over at Federated Hermes. Uh, helping us count those down to these closing bells, Scarlett, and now we're hitting session lows for uh, most of the major indices, fractional uh, losses to be sure here, but definitely, at least in the equity space, uh, the sentiment uh, that we saw to the upside in November, certainly not here at the start of December. Yeah, and we're looking for catalysts. Uh, what's going to get things going in the next round? Round. There's a whole bunch of data coming out tomorrow and, of course, uh, the jobs report on Friday. Mm. What would you say is the sentiment heading into this jobs report? I think most people, well, we talk about that trend line and uh, the idea that you're getting a softening labor market. But how many people we talked to said, yeah, it's softening, but that is sort of the basis of the soft landing, right? That it's more orderly. Mm -hmm. This isn't some fall off the cliff. I don't know if I buy that, but that, that is, does seem to be the narrative. Right. People want to see a softening, but not too much. I mean, it's that Goldilocks scenario once again where, you know, it can kind of continue to show this gradual slowing, but nothing that screams an emergency at any point. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I mean, if Blackpink can find a job, can't we all? <laughs> we are moving closer to the closing bells here on this Wednesday afternoon. Stick around. Full market coverage right here on Bloomberg as we take you to the bell and beyond. got stocks down. Were you the pride of Barnard back in the day? <laughs> you have was. to ask that. Thank you so much. I have to ask your whole professor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, uh, let's move on. Um, that would so, actually be some real research. We actually, were talking a little I did fairly well. Fa fairly well. Look okay. where I am. Look at where I landed. You know, yes, yes you've, done, you've done great, Kurt. I'm in great company. You've won, all, you've won all, so many awards. Yeah, I have. You want to talk about that instead of the markets? No, let's talk about the markets. <laughs> hey, right. you started it. <laughs> I did. I feel like I'm with my brothers. Um, uh, so here we go. Um, interesting day. We've seen certainly uh, investors moving into the banking area. We've had a banking conference going on, so we're getting commentary. City, uh, that news certainly got everybody's attention. Crypto, right? Bitcoin going above 44,000. Uh, it's just been an interesting day in terms of where investors have been moving, kind of reacting in some cases. Cases to yeah, but some fundamentals. At the same time, seeing some selling into the close, especially on the Nasdaq. Uh, surprised that the uh, softness in the uh, ADP report that we initially led to some optimism and a risk on trade didn't necessarily stick for the day. But I guess everybody's looking to Friday. And Poor ADB, report. ADP. Nobody loves that report. They did <laughs> earlier in the day. They just kind of blow it off. I, I actually love it. I mean, I know it's well because the problem is people always look at it as being the definitive predictor of what's going to happen with the monthly report. But you can't do that. I mean, there's a lot of other data. In there that's important beyond that headline number that I think does provide a lot of insight. So there's my plug for uh, nice. the folk, fine folks at ADP. Meanwhile, not necessarily a fine day in markets with all of the major indices of finishing the day in the red. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down about uh, 70 points or two-tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 down 18 points or four-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite lower by about six-tenths of a percent, while the Russell 2000 going to finish the day modestly lower by two-tenths of a percent. All right, digging a little bit deeper into the indices, you mentioned the Russell Romain. So kind of an even split in terms of winners and losers in that index. And if I look at the S&P 500, same story, uh, a little bit to uh, the upside, 277 names to the upside, 223 to the downside. But it's interesting, despite kind of finishing at our lows uh, uh, in terms of the headline, we did see some buyers in this market, Scarlett. We did. And some of those buyers headed into safe havens like utilities, uh, the utilities index or sub index here, uh, gaining 1.4% on the day, consumer durable. That's mainly home builders lifting that group up by 1%. Consumer services also doing well. On the downside, with the drop in WTI below $70 a barrel, you have 22 out of 23 members of the S&P 500 energy index lower. The exception is Kinder Morgan, which is a pipeline company. Chip companies and software services companies also lower by about 1%. All right, to the individual gainers we go. Uh, Citigroup on that list. Uh, definitely finishing way off its highs of the day when it was up more than 5%. You did 5%. four again. Four gainers? You don't like that, do you? All right, you? I'm going to go fast, okay? I promise. <laughs> she just makes me look if bad. If you don't interrupt me. Okay. All right, Citigroup up 2.5% in today's session. <laughs> Must <not> interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> you just couldn't resist. Uh, the CFO was saying uh, at that Goldman Sachs uh, U.S. Financial Services Conference that the company's on track to deliver full year revenue in line with the firm's earlier guidance, although at the lower end of that 78 to $79 billion target. Nonetheless, investors liked it up 2.5%. Airlines, another conference underway. 
Delta sparking a rally in the airline sector. That stock finishing up 3.5% on the session. Uh, Delta coming out reaffirming its full-year adjusted earnings per share forecast, um, actually ahead of a Morgan Stanley Consumer Conference. So we'll look for some headlines as that conference gets underway. Um, Walgreens Boost Alliance, it was... Uh, it's, it's, it's underway, Carol. Oh, is it? Yeah, okay. they spoke today. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt. You can interrupt me on that kind of stuff. Um, Walgreens uh, Boots Alliance, uh, top in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100, although I think it's kind of moved down a little bit among the top gainers in the S&P. Uh, it's down more than 40% year to date. Um, it's kind of tagging on a rally, a two-day rally of CVS Health, which is up as B of A says CVS has appropriately reset expectations for earnings growth over the uh, intermediate term. So I don't know. That's what some of the analysis was. And then Starbucks, I had to mention, record losing streak of 12 down days. It's over. Yes. Dun, da, 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 up 1.6% uh, in today's no. session. Why? Um, it just Because it can't go down every it day. Just <laughs> it just is. The answer is because it <laughs> can't go down Because we never answered day. why it was down for 12 days. I there thought was you maybe could answer about, why it was I think up it was, today. analysts said there was a concern about cooling sales. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. But you could say that about cold so brew. much, right? I don't know. Um, stock lost 11%, though, in that um, 12 down day losing streak. So maybe people said, okay, now it's time to buy. I don't know. It just is. Sometimes okay. it just is. It's a reversion to the mean. How about that? Nice. Tim, what do you got? Well, how maybe many, how many, people need how to many buy more <laughs> Jack Daniels or Woodford Reserve because the worst performer on a percentage basis in the S&P 500 today was the parent company of those two alcohol brands. Brown Foreman finished it down 10.4%. Uh, actually, it's worst day since March of 2020. That's how far back you have to go to find a day where it fell uh, by more than 10.4%. The company did report earnings per share and a net sales for the second quarter that trailed estimates, even though expectations were low. Uh, Brown Foreman also cut its uh, organic net sales and operating income forecast for the full year. Investors selling that stock today. Uh, Old Dominion Freightline, among the worst performers, the third worst performer on the S&P 500 on a percentage basis. The company did report year-over-year -year drop in revenue per day in November. Uh, shares finished the day down by 5.6%. And then Asana, the application software company uh, that only went public a few years ago, finished the day down by more than 16%, falling the most in more than a year. The the company did report revenue for the most recent quarter that came in below estimates. Uh, analysts said that there could be a, you know, there's still a weak economic environment that could be affecting the company's uh, stock price uh, and, of course, the company's business. Uh, there are concerns that growth could be sluggish as a result of the report that we saw late yesterday. HSBC and Morgan Stanley each cut their price targets on the stock shares down by, uh, yeah, more than 16% uh, today. And we should point out we saw something similar from some of the other uh, software companies as well uh, today. Uh, maybe that's start the start of some degree of a trend here. Uh, let's check in on the Treasury market right now because you are seen a bit of a rally, particularly on the longer end of the curve, or resumption of that rally, I should say. Modest gains on the day that push yields down on the 10-year by about five, four to five basis points, and on the 30-year by about seven basis points. Now, we should point out, uh, Carol, that this does seem to be uh, that positioning that is now starting around the Friday morning uh, job support here in the U.S., where people really are really sticking out their positions as to whether we get a hot report, a cool report, or something in between. Yeah, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Um, looking at Chewy in the aftermarket, Market, guys. It's down about 9% here as it uh, reports earnings. Uh, company's third quarter net sales, it's light. Uh, 2.74, just slightly light. 2.74 billion versus the estimate of 2.75 billion. Third quarter adjusted EBITDA, 82.1 million. Estimate 65.2. Trying to see why investors are selling. I mean, the stock's down 50% this year, about a 20% um, short on this position. So looking for a little bit more in terms of an outlook or something, but stock down about 5% here. Well, People not paying up for their pets, that's yeah. unthinkable. Well, we should point out that, that net mar <laughs> the net margin did contract in the quarter, too, did it? so that, okay. that could be a, an issue. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's take a look so at GameStop, possible. which uh, doesn't have any earnings, and again, it has a loss for the quarter, adjusted loss per share for the third quarter, 18 mm -hmm. cents. Analysts were looking for a loss of 7.7 .7 cents, so that's a lot worse than expected. Mm -hmm. Net sales for the period, $1.08 billion. Analysts were looking for $1.18 billion. So a uh, miss on sales and a miss on the bottom line yeah. as well. Sorry. Well, guess what? Yeah. They're not even having a conference call today. <laughs> yeah. Me. Sorry, I, I have my hand yeah. raised, Tim. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, That's I don't that. know how this works on, on the show. But but yeah, there's no conference call. And, and speaking of that, did you actually look at the press release? It's, yeah, it says, one, two, three, four, five. It's like seven lines long. And then the last line is the company will not be holding a conference call today. But you can look <laughs> yeah. for the 10Q. I, I, would just 10Q. Like, I would just like to point out the disclosures, the, 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 the oh, regulatory wow. disclosures are actually longer, way longer. than the press release itself. 
here. Yeah, well, when is the point. turnaround? So what does that say uh, well, about it this yet? company? <laughs> when, when GTA 6 comes out, that's when the turnaround happens. <laughs> but... <laughs> I know we're laughing because we don't know when that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I mean, but this, I mean, in all seriousness, this, I mean, what, I mean, what is the strategy? I mean, he's, I mean, he's never really articulated it, at least not to a way that folks liked. And I think there was this idea that, well, with certain types of investors that have gravitated to the stock, you don't really need to do all the rigmarole with these long press releases and conference calls because people were buying into a story or a narrative. But I haven't heard that story or narrative in some time. Well, there's stories, there's narratives, and then there's fundamentals, right? Uh, not for this stock, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I agree. But I mean... In general. Yeah. Isn't it funny how uh, Chewy and GameStop actually have their results on the same day today? I mean, Ryan Cohen's <laughs> yeah, was original... That plan was that planned? I don't think so. But yeah. I mean, that's originally why people were excited about GameStop. Look what he did at Chewy early on in Chewy's life. Yeah. Uh, they thought he could do the same thing to GameStop, and that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Well, and he's now kind of the last person standing, right? He's basically, <laughs> basically the only adult out there right now. Maybe he's too busy turning it around to have an earnings call. Yeah, well, good Has for Has anyone him. seen Dumb Money? I think I know I've asked this before. Yeah. No, we had the um, producers on. Yeah. Oh. For Dumb Money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It was it was interesting. Exactly. Did you like it? <laughs> um, I did. I, I really liked seeing the cameos of all of Bloomberg TV on there. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Amane was on there a few times. All right. <laughs> is that why you're talking about this? <laughs> oh, is that why? Now I have to go see I it. Bring it up. It's I don't get enough from it. I have to. And we thought you were such a shy kind of guy. Me? Have you met me? <laughs> Sarcasm. Sarcasm. Hey, everybody say goodbye to Carol because you're not going to see her for a while. Where? Are you Wait, off? Carol, you're off on vacation? Um, she's tight lipped there. Who knows yeah, where she's, she's going? She's what nodding. She's I'm doing not the, great radio, I'm doing but she's the nodding. not buying stuff and experiencing stuff. Ah, uh, yes. You know, like, you Contributing know. to services. You got it. The services part okay, of the Well, company. don't forget, you have three people sitting next to you on the screen here who expect a little. Do you like gifts? Is that what you're saying? I, I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> Particularly from a very valued friend uh, and, and, and associate. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, yeah. The sound's cutting out. All right, I gotta go. We gotta go. Otherwise, we're gonna start yelling at us. Love you guys. Be well. Stay safe. All right, we'll see you. Um, Cross pop from coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, it's Bloomberg Originals. <laughs> it's hard to say goodbye. See ya. All right, stick around. A lot more coverage coming up here on Bloomberg Television, including a deeper dive into some of the results that we just got out of GameStop, Chewy, and a couple other companies. That's coming up next right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Uh, here on this Wednesday afternoon, closing out the trading day. And the big move today was not in the equity market, not even necessarily in the bond market. It was in oil. WTI crude down more than 4% on the day, back below that $70 a barrel mark here. And when you go by where we were just about two and a half months ago at around 93, 94 bucks a barrel, that's probably one of the fastest drops that we've seen in quite some time. At least a drop, the fastest drop that we've seen that wasn't actually predicated on some sort of black swan type of catalyst. But as Abigail Doolittle has pointed out time and time again using this exact chart. You could have actually divined this if you paid attention to the technical patterns over the past month or so. The trend line was to the downside going all the way back to early August, or early October, excuse me, and that proved to be the case with the big drop that we had today. As for the rest of the markets, the S&P down fractionally on the day, as were most of the other major indices here. Bitcoin taking a little bit of a pause after breaching that 44,000 mark to the upside here, pulling back just a little bit on the back of that phenomenal 150 plus percent plus rally on a year to date basis. And two interesting stories uh, in the, uh, I guess, the food and beverage space, if you will. Campbell Soup came out with earnings, shares having their best day going back to March. That company not only beat in the most recent quarter, but stood by their fiscal year forecast and Brown Foreman the maker of Jack Daniels, as well as a lot of other liquors, basically saying they're seeing a lot of softness in demand there. Those shares were down 10% here on the day. Meanwhile, we have to go back to the Treasury market where we did see a resumption of that Treasury rally, but I want you to really pay attention to the technicals here because one of the reasons why we've seen that rally kind of sputter just a little bit is because it is hitting some key technical levels. This is the five-year Treasury right now. The yellow line is your 200-day moving average, and it's been testing that for the last couple of days, whether it breaches that to the downside or manages to keep pushing up higher. We're going to find out, I guess, maybe on Friday morning when we get that jobs report.
All right, let's uh, move on to earnings after the close because even though it's basically late in the earnings season, there were some numbers that came out, notably from Chewy and GameStop. Both those stocks falling in after hours trading. We're also waiting for C3 AI to report results shortly as well. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz to discuss. Um, Bailey, I want to start with Chewy because the move here is pretty large, down about 9% in after hours trading. Uh, a miss on the net sales number. Romain was talking about margins not looking as good either. Um, this has to do with discretionary spending, although you can make the argument that spending on your pets is not discretionary. It's it's a staple. Well, yes and no. I mean, that was the thing we saw from Petco's results last week. They missed expectations really across the board and talked down not only the end of this year, the final quarter, but also next year. And the big driver was that consumers are downgrading. So whether you were buying nice, you know, healthy food for your dog, maybe if you're feeling a pinch now, you're buying kind of run-of-the-mill private label foods. And same thing with snacks. And when you look at it, Romain pointing it out, you look at the net loss, you look at the net margin. Uh, this is a company that still is trying to grapple with consumers tightening with competition. And when you look at it, yeah. really since that pandemic boom, they still are trying to figure that out. Well, I want to talk about that competition because I don't necessarily buy the idea that people trade down. I know there are probably some consumers that are forced to do that, but pets are kind of like children in a certain way where you're just going to continue to buy whatever they demand for the most part to keep them from tearing up your house. Uh, just speaking for a friend. And I, I am curious about whether there's an issue of why go to Chewy when you can get the exact same thing or most of the same things uh, on Walmart or Amazon or Target or other places. Well, that was their big pitch, and that's why they were such a roaring success during the pandemic is people realized it was a lot easier to order from Chewy, have the subscription, have your dog food or your snacks or treats showing up at your doorstep every other month or every month. But now if you are feeling the pinch, if you are shopping and using Google and seeing, yeah. all right, actually it's cheaper on Amazon, it's cheaper gotcha. if you are running an errand at Walmart. That could be part of the driver. Also, just the general sense that maybe people don't have as many pets as they had at the pandemic. Mm, mm -hmm. What do they do with those pets? Buddy? I don't want to talk about what happens. They're to the returning buckets. them to the shelters. No, in a lot of cases. don't. Yeah. Why did you say well, that? I know. Blame, blame it on the companies that are forcing people to go back into the office. <laughs> you know, the pets don't do well sitting at home by themselves. Exactly. In a place like New York, if you have a husky, your husky is not built to sit in a, an yeah. apartment all day. It's also not built to sit in a shelter either. Mm, yeah. But that's a separate story. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Let's talk about GameStop. Uh, GameStop, which has not reported an annual profit since going back to 2018, uh, coming up with a loss that was bigger than expected. We were joking around about the press release announcing its results. Really bare bones. Yeah, how long did it take you to read that? Uh, I read it while waiting to come on set there you in go. about 35 yeah. seconds. It's just numbers, and that's really been the, the fact since Ryan Cohen started to push for changes and really drive the shift now CEO Ryan Cohen. But no statement, no call. They haven't had a call since he really took over and became the largest shareholder. Only only down 1.3% interesting because pretty large miss on net sales overall, but hardware and software declining some 7.5, 8 8.7% year over year. So slowing sales in a company that still very much is predicated on Ryan Cohen delivering some kind of future. You were covering this uh, stock when it was really a high flyer. And there were, and, and look, for all of the, we, we joke a lot about, you know, this just being a meme stock, there's no fundamentals, but there really was a fundamental story there. Anyone who followed Roaring Kitty or saw the movie knows that there was a fundamental story there. What happened to that? It did didn't plan out, pan out right. as many were expecting. Yeah. The one thing that I, I always do point out, though, it's still four and a half million dollars, but it cleaned out its debt load. Yeah. Unlike no debt, and, and they actually a lot of cash on the balance. And they have, I didn't they look at the most recent quarter, million. but yeah, yeah, they still have plenty yeah. of cash. It's really what does Ryan Cohen do with that? Because it seems like they pivoted from okay, we're going to be a brick and mortar retailer to direct to consumer, and then that didn't pan out quite as they yeah. were hoping. And now they're shifting back into cutting some of those costs with uh, underperforming stores and leaning into well-performing stores. But if you've been to a mall outside of Black Friday, yeah. there's not really a lot of foot traffic. And I actually went into a GameStop. It was a freestanding one on, on, the, on the street here in New York. And it was, A, there, there weren't that many people in there. There was actually two customers. I was the third. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I noticed it was very um, not nice, yeah. <laughs> to say the least. They didn't keep up. Which I was, I don't know if it was just that one store. I don't want to like paint all of the GameStops like that. But I was kind of shocked. I was like, this isn't really an inviting place. Well, that was the big thing yeah. when Ryan Cohen was first kind of pushing for the changes in yeah. management, is he would pop up at stores, and he would kind of lay in to managers that weren't keeping track and weren't making sure the storefronts were in good shape. But yeah. as you mentioned, if you go to some, it's pretty scarce and bare bones. A lot of used yeah. games and not that many. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah there was nothing yeah. on the shelves. I was um, okay. Anyway, I didn't get it. 
Uh, Bailey Lipschultz uh, has been all over this uh, stock for the last few years. A closer look at GameStop moving lower here and after hours trading by a couple percentage points and Chewy down about 8%. Uh, in just a minute, we're going to go back down to Washington where big bank CEOs did testify before Senate arguing against new capital requirements. Gerard Cassidy, head of U.S. Bank Equity Strategy over at RBC Capital, going to be joining us to give his, his insights in just a second. This is Bloomberg. Biggest banks took their most direct swing yet at Washington's plans to force them to set aside more cash as a buffer against losses. For more on today's Senate Banking Committee hearing, let's bring in Gerard Cassidy. Gerard is head of U.S. Bank Equity Strategy at RBC Capital Markets. And Gerard, um, the proposal we know is to require these big banks to increase their capital cushion by almost 20 percent. And banks, of course, and uh, the CEOs made that very clear, were very vocal about that reducing lending, increasing costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Are regulators going to compromise, do you think? I, I think they, they will, actually, Scarlett, because what's interesting here is there's some strange bedfellows lining up uh, to water down this kind of uh, regulation. When I say that, you know, you look at the NCAAP and the energy industry, both of them are pushing for, you know, pushing back on the tax uh, tax financing of low-cost housing or alternative energy, and you normally don't see those types of bedfellows fighting for the same uh, reasons. So I think there will be some scaling back. I, I don't think it will go away at all, but it, there still will be the, the requirement that the banks are going to have to carry greater levels of liquidity and greater um, capital levels, but let's hope it's not as draconian as it's been proposed so far. So what did today's hearing really accomplish then? Um, if, if there's been this lobbying effort underway for months now, bring in other industries, and I believe uh, a lot of small businesses have made their case too. W what did it accomplish? What, what's going to be the end result that they can point to? I think they made it very loud and clear that something has to change. And to be able to do that in front of the Senate Banking Committee, it's a very powerful committee, of course, and it has some very senior legislators on that committee. So they needed to hear it firsthand from the senior CEOs of these companies, which they did. So I think, it, you know, it's just more power in the punch when they all were there talking about the um, impact that, that, that this could have on not just big business, but on consumers, on the economy, and it could really slow things down. And they have to really take it uh, carefully to make sure that these regulations don't really crimp the banking industry to the point where it really does have a direct impact on the economy. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, though, Gerard, that a lot of uh, sort of what has hurt the banks has simply uh, not really disappeared from the economy, but just kind of shifted to private markets, private capital, private equity, if you will. I, I guess I know there's no real way to quantify that, but do you find some credence in that? And if so, is there risk in that? Romain, it definitely has happened. So in the J.P. Morgan annual report this year, in the shareholder letter um, penned by Jamie Dimon, he pointed out that there's $12 trillion of loans outstanding in the U.S. banking industry, and there's $22 trillion of loans that have been made by non-bank financials. You look at the shadow banking industry, and the Federal Reserve provides this data, they have taken great market share from the banks. So it's our view that this has been underway for many years, decades, actually. And so there is credence to it. And so the question really comes, what kind of risk is being pushed outside the banking industry, which is not regulated, as you know, Romain? And so it's, it's hard to say because it's very opaque. It's hard, it's hard to get the information we need on those non-bank lenders. But right now, they are a very big, important part of the lending infrastructure of this economy. Oh, absolutely, to say the least. It'll be interesting to see if they ever drag, you know, Harvey uh, Schwartz and uh, Kravis and Roberts and, and those folks all up on Capitol Hill. I have a feeling uh, that they're, that back and forth might be a little bit different uh, than what we saw today. I, I do want to get to uh, also just real quickly uh, here, uh, Gerard, uh, the idea of who's going to be running these banks. I mean, we just kind of showed all of the people who were there today. We know Diamond's getting up there in age. You've already got a succession plan in place for uh, Gorman, and uh, obviously there's a ton of speculation surrounding whatever the heck's going on at Goldman. I mean, what's going to be the new leadership, given that, you know, the banking industry has changed so much since those guys took over uh, back in the day, uh, you know, with the exception of Jane Frazier, who's fairly new. But I'm just curious as to what you think that lineup is going to look like in the future. 
many of these banks have very deep ventures, particularly J.P. Morgan. There's a number of executives, Romain, that you're probably aware of that used to work at J.P. Morgan and now are CEOs at other companies. Um, Charlie uh, over at Wells Fargo is, is a good example of that. And so I would say that you do have deep ventures in these companies, um, and they'll elevate their executives, just like what you mentioned with Morgan Stanley, with James Gorman. They chose Ted Pick, who's the senior executive within the company, and we would expect the other companies to do the same, whether it's Bank America or J.P. Morgan. When it's time, and we're not suggesting it's anytime soon, but these companies have well laid out plans that the board looks at all the time that should their CEOs decide to step down, they will start the process to replace them. And generally, I would say they all would be replaced by internal hires and not outside. Who would be the next CEO that you see, um, or which, which next bank is going to change their CEO, do you think? It's hard to say. It really comes down to age. So, you know, you have to go for the CEOs that are older. As, as you mentioned, Jane Frazier is relatively new, so it's clearly, clearly not going to be Citigroup. But you, you look at Jamie Dimon, Brian Moynihan, they're obviously been in their roles and have done both, have done great jobs yeah. in turning their bank, or well, Bank of America, turning it around. And Dimon at JP Morgan has led it to new highs. So you would have to think at some point, yeah. that, you know, age catches up to all of us. So eventually they'll have to face that decision when it comes. All right, Gerard, always wonderful to talk to you. Gerard Cassidy over at RBC, one of the best in the business. As we move forward here in the show, coming up here, the head of U.S. equity strategy over at SockGen. This is Bloomberg. A bit of a pause in the equity rally and a resumption in the Treasury rally uh, on this uh, Wednesday afternoon here in the U.S. Fractional losses are on the day for U.S. equities. But when you look at the moves that you saw in the Treasury space, it does add credence to this idea that the doves really have come back out, or at least the perception of those doves has come back out. But then you take a look at what happened in commodities today, and guess what? The bears came out as well. Big drops that we saw today, not only in energy with WTI crude dropping back below 70 bucks a barrel, but a big down draft that we saw in a lot of those industrial commodities and even in some key agriculture commodities as well. Bets on maybe softer economic conditions going forward. Bets on softer economic conditions not necessarily reflected in the equity market and at least for today not necessarily reflected in the bond market either. Scarlett? Yeah, the moves that we've seen uh, this month have been fairly quiet compared to what we had in November. A stock and bond market rally that really came as a surprise to so many. Now that we're in December as more muted data is released investors are digesting all this news pretty cautiously. With more on the outlook, let's bring in Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abigail? Well, Scarlett, to uh, take a look at the outlook, let's take a look back because we are at that time of the year where folks are putting out their 2024 forecasts and we're taking a look back and it's been a pretty good year. You can see the S&P 500 up 18.5 percent, the stock 600. Take a look at the Nikkei up 28 uh, percent, the best year since 2013. The Hang Seng not so much down 17 percent, but for the most part stocks globally are really doing pretty well. As for that S&P 500, uh, if we take a look at what the influence could be for the forecasts ahead, well, you know, there's so many factors. Possible recession, it's of course a president year that should be in theory good for stocks uh, geopolitical but it will probably come down to the Fed because at this point you can make the case that the market is pricing in cuts at least 100 basis points. Some are saying more. This is the two-year yield. You can see it at 460, the Fed target rate at 550. Not so long ago, that two-year yield was at a 526, uh, and making that case that to some degree uh, these possible rate cuts next year uh, are already priced in. Of course, they are in the dot plot, but the question is around timing, and of course, the presidential cycle plays in, too. So many complexities. What is it? Where does it leave the street road? Main. Well, up top we have Deutsche Bank at 5100, Bank of America not so far behind. JP Morgan is the low guy on the street or gal at 4200. I was surprised to see that. I thought it would be Morgan Stanley, but Morgan Stanley's at uh, 4500. A wide range, and you can see lots of sideway action here. It 
It's going to be very interesting to see, of course, not just where we end out this year, but the end of 2024. Yeah, absolutely. So particularly with an S&P right now, sitting right around 45, uh, 50 and change. And when you look at the average of estimates of uh, folks uh, surveyed here uh, by Bloomberg, uh, folks on the street here, you're looking at, well, a median estimate that is really quite, right, right, frankly, where we're at right now, an average estimate that's only a smidge higher than where we're at right now, and even the high end of those estimates really not much different. Manish Kabra joining us right now, head of U.S. Equity Strategy over at Society General. He's forecasting the S&P 500 will actually rise to about 4750 by the end of 2024, but he does say it could be a bumpy ride. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, today. And let's talk a little bit about, I guess, what makes it a bumpy ride. Is it the uncertainty about the economy, the Fed? What? It's a fair point. Like, I think what we see is, you know, S&P will flirt with all-time highs. Uh, you know, it will try to reach 47.50. Um, and all the gains are literally front-loaded. All the gains, the driver, you know, of the S&P is literally NASDAQ 100. It's the tech companies, it's the industrial companies. It's not traditional U.S. economy. And, and I think, you know, that's where our biggest difference, you know, differentiating call is, you know, I, uh, which is, you know, we are staying bearish small caps, we are staying bearish financials, you know, we are staying bearish everything which is sensitive to the yield curve, which is sensitive to the Fed. Uh, and I think it's all of those realization that is making us think, you know, three things uh, in middle of the year that will, you know, that can surprise one. Yeah. We expect consumer spending downturn. You know, we expect small businesses, you know, refinancing cycle to pick up very sharply exactly at a time. You know, when rates, you know, rate of borrowing for small firms is at, you know, nearly all time highs today. So, so I think it's, you know, it's combination of things which is making us think it's, you know, it will not be a smooth ride, but but for sure currently, you know, the the profit cycle, as in especially for tech, for industrials, yeah. you know, that can lead the whole index higher pretty well, well from here. So, so yeah, front, front loaded gains, uh, you know, new highs, as in flirting with new highs yeah. is, is what the message is, but it's, it's a very bumpy ride. But even with that bumpy, if we do get to a higher level than where we are now, at least a meaningfully higher level at 47.50 or maybe even more, it doesn't sound like you think that's going to be a broad base type of rally. Uh, that's right, and and I I think the uh, as in it, it depends what part of the market you're watching. If you're watching the tech sector, if you're watching the industrial sector, you have very very broad based performance. You know, the moment you start looking at small caps, uh, you know that that's where I would say it's the third time small caps are trying to make this 15% rally. Uh, but you go back to fundamentals, you find they don't have profit margins in the U.S. They don't have, uh, you know, and they have massive refinancing cycle coming up and. You know, lending standards, which are still extremely tough. Uh, and, and I think it's the lending standards, the driver of the lending standard is the yield curve. And at the moment where market is totally ignoring the yield curve, uh, I think that's the realization in the middle of the year that would happen. Which sectors have the free cash flow, have the balance sheet to get through that middle of the year where things are going to get really rocky? So look, this is this is all about Nasdaq. This is all about Nasdaq 100. That's the top 100, you know, large cap growth companies. As in, they are the ones that are booming. They're booming on earnings. They don't have, you know, as in, if I just give you anecdotes, as in, you have Microsoft, uh, you know, that has more debt 2040 onwards than over the next two years. Uh, I, I think it's the, you know, top 10% of S&P 1500, which is literally 80% of S&P 500 as a benchmark. They have the highest, uh, you know, interest coverage ratio, which is mm -hmm. their profits versus interest cost is at 15 times. So, so I think it, you know, as a large cap growth, you know, that dominance will stay in the market up until we have seen at least, uh, I would say, at least 100 basis points of Fed rate cuts. Uh, up until then, I think the whole idea of narrow breadth or knowing that you want to buy Nasdaq, you want to buy Nasdaq equal weighted. I think you do, even if someone doesn't wants to take the I would say concentrated bets, you know, that some of the U.S. indices have at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I think Nasdaq 100 equal weighted is a very good place to, you know, place to be diversifying this large cap growth exposure. So in other words, the performance could be very similar to what we have in 2023 with tech, communication services and consumer discretionary leading the way thanks to those magnificent seven. 2024 is going to be an election year and I know there's been a lot of research done on what tends to happen in an election, a presidential election year. How are you thinking about um, how the Fed proceeds, especially with this very sensitive election coming up? Um, 
as in Fed, Fed, Fed tries to be independent, as in if we just look at last, you know, last as in elections over the last 60 years, we have seen, you know, S&P gives positive returns, but volatility in returns or, or the VIX as a measure, it actually picks up, you know, literally in Q3 of every election cycle. So as, as in our, our, our take is, you know, as in whether it's Republicans, whether it's Democrats, as in a lot of the volatility will pick up in Q3, but at the same time, you know, what we have seen, whether it was Trump, whether it's been Biden, as in whether Republican, whether Democrats, the only trade that has worked during both the episodes is literally buying, you know, the whole message of reindustrialization of the U.S., mm -hmm. you know, is finding out what are the reshoring stocks, you know, or stocks that benefiting of, you know, benefits on back of reshoring yeah. of activity. Um, they have done really well, as in they have done well. Uh, during the election year, they have done well. Literally, the third year of the election year as well. So, so I think that's you know that that's what we are flagging. This is you know uh, more than Fed watching that which government will literally come out and control mm -hmm. the fiscal policy, and we are not seeing that. You know, we haven't seen that with Republicans or Democrats. So Got the it. whole leverage in the system is you know is with the U.S. government, and and I think that's the reason. As an I, you know, a, a lot of talking points have been around the bond market, right? Uh, and we see bond deals even in our mild recession scenario that we have in you know second third quarter next year, we don't see bond deals going below 3.75, you know, which is a big shift from the mindset sure. that generally bond deals tends to make you know new lows. Manish. Really appreciate your joining us. Manish Cabra is head of U.S. Equity Strategy at Societe Generale. He has an S&P 500 target of 4750 by the end of 2024. Now, coming up, we have a live conversation with the CEO of AMD, Lisa Su. This is The Close on Bloomberg. The AI race heating up as advanced micro devices finally unveiling its new line of AI accelerator chips. It's part of AMD's uh, run uh, to make its run software run faster than rivals like NVIDIA. Here to recap what we know, let's bring in, uh, get to Rachel Metz out of Pier 3 in San Francisco, joining us right now. And Rachel, I mean, this has been a long time coming. I know for folks who want to see everything happen overnight, but uh, this does seem to be a pretty quick turnaround, uh, an entry into this space, an expansion into this space that investors have been looking for. Yeah, so AMD is said today that, um, well, it said a few things. One is it gave a forecast for um, the market for AI chips, which is much larger than what it has said in the past. But it also said that it's putting out these new chips that are going to be as good as the best chips that its rival NVIDIA has on the market. So it's going to be interesting to watch over the next few months sort of how these two companies uh, negotiate with a number of customers that are super hungry for AI training chips. Is it as simple as the customers that can't get um, their orders fulfilled by AMD uh, by Nvidia just go over to AMD? It's not quite that simple because if you are, uh, let's say you're training an AI model and you need to use specialized chips to do that, you also have to make sure that your software is going to work well on these chips. And so there there can be some work that has to be done there to make it work properly. Uh, you know, it, can, it can be time consuming to make that stuff happen as well as having to secure the chips and pay the money for the chips, that sort of stuff. Uh, give, do we ha no, have any sense here about the technology behind it and how it actually stacks up against NVIDIA's offering? Yeah, so they're saying that it, um, I think they said it stacks up quite favorably against um, NVIDIA's top uh, chip for AI right now, which is the H100. But we also know that NVIDIA, of, of course, they're not stopping. They're working on their next chip, which should be even better than, than the H100. So we're going to have to see, uh, I guess, early next year, sort of how those things stack up against each other. Yeah, this is definitely a, a big question mark here. Um, so many people talking about the AI uh, chips for NVIDIA and for AMD being in the second half 2024 story rather than a first half 2024 story. What's going to be the narrative in the first half that gets us to the second half where the, the numbers start showing up? In the first half, I would guess that it's going to be about, well, who's planning to use these chips? Um, already some large companies have said they're planning to use them, including Microsoft, um, which, as we know, is the biggest investor in OpenAI and is closely partnered with them. So it's going to be interesting in the coming months to see who says they're going to be using it, and then maybe we'll start to see what the results of that are. 
All right, Rachel Metz, really appreciate your joining us. Rachel Metz covers AI for Bloomberg News. She's written a lot, obviously, about open AI and a lot of the drama that's been taking place there. Thank you so much. And of course, we mentioned AMD, AMD and what it's been doing. Let's turn now to that event where Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow is sitting down with the CEO, Lisa Su. Ed? And I want to welcome both our Bloomberg television and radio audiences worldwide. We are live here in San Jose with Lisa Su, the CEO of AMD. It's been an incredibly busy day for you, but there's a lot of emphasis on the importance of MI300X, your latest AI accelerator. The, the technological difference vis-a-vis -vis the H100, NVIDIA's, is uh, HBM3, high bandwidth memory. But what advantage does that give you in the immediate term against what is a clear market incumbent in the space? Yeah, well, first of all, um, it's great to be here. Thank you guys for uh, being on site and spending so much time with us today. Um, it's been a big, big day for AMD. We're so excited about, uh, first, the opportunity in AI is just absolutely exploding. Um, and then we're talking today about the launch of our MI300X, which is our, you know, let's call it the, the leading edge uh, data center uh, AI accelerator. And, you know, we were here with a lot of our partners as well. So, you know, your, your, your comment about, you know, what's special about MI300X, I mean, the, the truth is, uh, we've all experienced over the last, you know, 12 months, this incredible revolution, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, ChatGPT has, has really changed the way we think about what tech can do. And the underlying capability of that is GPUs and, you know, very, very capable GPUs. Um, you know, we made some very, very good decisions, um, you know, a few years ago about how to put together this technology, and that includes includes um both being very good for training, so training large models, um, but also very good for um, answering questions or inference. So when you ask you know, the, uh, ChatGPT a question, um, it takes sometimes a little bit of time for it to respond to an answer. Some latency. There's some latency there, and um, you know, we found uh, you know, really a great technological solution by adding you know, lots of um, high bandwidth memory or memory capacity. Uh, Which and NVIDIA will not have until H200, second quarter of next year. Uh, that is correct. We are industry leaning, uh, so you know, best in class in terms of inference performance. And uh, what, what is the side by side, Lisa, on training and performance? Mi three hundred X versus H one hundred. Yeah. So if you look at, um, and we showed some of the benchmarks um, earlier today. If you look at training performance, um, we're very, very competitive. Let's call it, you know, it's it's a toss up. When you look at inference performance, uh, we're one point four to one point six times better. And you know what that means is, you know, if you're running these models, you can actually run on more models, or you can run larger models, um, you know, with uh, MI300. And, and right now, you know, the key to AI is GPU compute. I mean, that is absolutely what everybody says, and, and so we're here to provide lots of GPU compute. You've had the confidence to dramatically alter your your forecast for this market for AI accelerators. You're saying a total addressable market of 400 billion US dollars in 2027. In August, just in August, you said it was. 150 billion. What has changed? Yeah, and you know, uh, really, the way we look at these things is we usually look at these things on an annual basis. And so, you know, when we were, you know, doing our plan for 2023 and beyond last year, uh, we thought that um, you know this year there would be about a 30 billion dollar market, and it would grow, you know, 50 percent um, compound annual growth rate. So, be about 150 billion in 2027, uh, which frankly was very, very large. Um, but what's changed? Is we, we can all see what's changed, right? People need more compute. They're installing more. Um, you know, the, the, the numbers for this year are probably closer to 45 billion. And when we talk to customers, when I spend time with our partners, and um, you know, what they tell us is uh, the technology requires more compute. And so we now believe the total market for this, um, it's upwards of 400 billion in 2027. It's huge. Uh, there's no one size fits all. There are going to be multiple solutions. Um, there are lots of good solutions um, out there today, but uh, we, we believe the AMD capability is uh, you know, very significant, and, and so we're excited about it. It was interesting to see on stage how MI300X manifests itself in the real world, but you'd already guided us that it will likely be the, the quickest AMD product to $1 billion. There were sections of the market in the street that said your forecast of $2 billion of sales for MI300X in 24 was conservative. If you're saying that the total total addressable market by 2027 is now 400 billion, then is that two billion forecast for next year specifically for MI300X conservative as the market <laughs> thinks it is? Well, 
I think you have to take a step back and just look at how this technology is evolving. So, uh, you know, we did update in our last, um, you know, conference call to an expectation of about two billion in 2024 uh, for our data center GPUs. Um, it's a very early estimate. Um, I would say, you know, we have clear line of sight to that. Uh, but, you know, what people ask me is, you know, like, there's much more customer demand, definitely, and there's also um, you know, significantly more supply because we've had to prepare the supply chain so that we're ready to ramp. So we'll update as we go along. You know, we, we are um, you know, definitely on this path to ramp um, MI300 uh, the fastest as anything's ever ramped at, at AMD. And you know, I view this as a multi-year opportunity for us. Uh, a reminder to our Bloomberg television and radio audience worldwide, we're live with Lisa Su, the AMD CEO here in San Jose. I mean, supply is a key question because when you say about $2 billion, about could mean less or more than $2 billion. But what is the state of supply right now? Has it improved such that actually you could exceed your expectations because you have visibility on a greater volume of GPUs to hand over to customers? Yeah, for sure. When we plan, um, we plan for success. And so our planning has um, the capability to be significantly higher than $2 billion. Um, we have you know, customer demand, you know, sort of lots and lots of interest uh, for MI300. And I think the key for us is you know, one step at a time. Right? Today was a, a huge day in terms of the launch. Uh, we're actively in deployment with a number of the customers and partners, you know, Microsoft on stage, or Oracle, Meta, um, our OEM partners, Dell, Lenovo, Supermicro, um, everyone is um, you know, really doing just phenomenal HPE on the MI300A side. So um, a great, great set of partners and a great partnerships um, for us to ramp as, as fast as possible. What's happening right now is you have AMD coming to the cutting edge with MI300X by adding HBM3. NVIDIA has the H100, H200 is coming, they have Grasshopper Superchip. And at the same time, the hyperscalers are really aggressively investing in their own silicon. How does that work in practice? If you're trying to yeah. say, I've got the cutting edge in AI accelerators, and the hyperscaler is saying, I also have the cutting edge in, in AI accelerators, are you competitors, are you collaborators, which is it? I, I think we are first and foremost collaborators. I mean, you know, I, what we see that's really happening is everybody realizes the foundation is the silicon compute. So of course people are going to invest in silicon. Um, now from my standpoint, um, compute is hard. And it's especially hard if you're trying to address the bleeding edge. So you know, our expectation is there will be solutions. There will be some proprietary solutions. There will be a lot of GPUs. You know, In my $400 billion TAM, I would say it's um, predominantly GPUs. And um, we work in collaboration. So there will be multiple solutions, but for the largest language models, for the most complex workloads, uh, we believe that we're extremely well positioned. Actually, a question from our Bloomberg technology audience globally when I said that you were coming on, on the show is, take that TAM for 2027, 400 billion, but tell us how much of it is, is driven by inference and how much of, is driven by training, because there's a chance that a lot of the training is complete by then. Yeah. I, I, by the way, I don't think the training will be complete by then because I think there will be a desire to continue to get better. To you know, if you think about uh, you know what we're really looking for is you know how does AI really become um, you know as sophisticated as capable as as humans? There's still a lot that we can do. Um, but that being the case, um, we do view that the um, the inference market will even grow faster. Uh, that will be even more queries. And so you know, if I look at 2027, I think more than half the market will be inference. More than half inference. Yes. Where is it right now? It's, 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 it's predominantly training right now as people are and training. I, and I mean in the context specifically of demand for MI300X. Yeah, so if I think about um, the market today, there's a lot of training. I think if you think about MI300X and what we see in 2024, um, it's a good balance between training and inference. But certainly on inference, um, we just have killer performance. So a, a lot of the chatter that here in the Valley is no matter how good the GPUs are, in some places is the software that comes with it and manages it is not that good. And one of the questions put to me for you is, is how much are you going to invest in software and how good do you think you are at software? Yeah, look, we've spent um, a significant amount of resources, both organically and inorganically. Um, we just acquired a couple of companies um, to augment our software resource standpoint. Uh, we think we're very well positioned. Um, today we announced our next generation, Rockham uh, 6, uh, which is really designed for Gen AI workload 
loads. I know it's a little bit of a detail. Um, what customers are telling us is MI300 is actually really easy to use. Um, you know, we've gotten sort of the yes. heavy lifting done. Uh, we've really focused on these higher level frameworks. So, you know, people really like uh, actually building models and building um, their applications in uh, PyTorch. And, you know, PyTorch is um, an open ecosystem. It works very, very well with AMD. And so these are, you know, some of many steps. We announced this morning that uh, OpenAI Triton is also, um, you know, optimizing with AMD on their next revision. Yes. So we're making a lot of progress. And for sure, um, I think on the software side, we're, we're absolutely ready. Lisa, even in the short time I've been in Silicon Valley, six years, people have said AMD won't do it. They won't, they won't beat, they won't enter the market. Intel will beat them on PC. In the context of AI, will you beat NVIDIA or will you be competitive? You know, uh, what I'd like to say is uh, we are very, very focused on our roadmap, Ed. I have to say, um, this is about um, what do we believe is important for the market and how are we shooting for um, you know, where the market is going. So yeah, I think we're going to do great in AI. I mean, I think AI is our number one priority. Hopefully that was clear today. Uh, you know, We've pivoted the company to really focus on AI. I think there are going to be multiple winners in AI. And as you know, kind of important as the cloud is, we think enterprise is really important. We think HPC is very important. We think PCs are very important. And you know, this is kind of the, the next big wave in tech. AMD CEO Lisa Su, thank you. This is Bloomberg. Our thanks, Ed Lolo, out there with AMD CEO Lisa Su at that conference here. Uh, let's uh, push ahead, Scarlett, to actually what the markets are going to have their eye on over the next 24 hours. And we start here in the U.S. with the fourth GOP uh, presidential debate. Yeah, but the front runner is not participating again, so I'm not sure what we're going to get out of this. Yeah, absolutely. We also get a lot of data out of uh, uh, the EU and China. European Commission and uh, Council President Ursula von der Leyen uh, will be in China this week for the first in-person summit with Beijing's leadership in and years. You can bet that EV subsidies will be on the agenda there. Earnings from Broadcom, Dollar General, and Lululemon, and we get economic data tomorrow as well. Watching jobless claims. All right, stick with us. Balance of Power is coming up next. Scarlett and I will be back tomorrow. This is The Close on Bloomberg.